Hello, gang. Welcome to Sketching with Izzy. We're just going to go ahead and get started today. Um, I just finished making my cup of coffee. Had a nice shower. Life is good. Hopefully you guys can hear me. And life is good for you. How are we doing here? Irina, hi. How are you doing this weekend? We are painting a monster. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, last weekend. I don't remember when I started this one, actually, to be honest. Time has no meaning in this place. Fun to wonk. Hey, hey. Glad you could join. It's good to see you all on. All right. Let's see what the hell I was doing here. Hmm. Looks like I was doing final renders on the body. I left the feet. Could still work out the the wall behind him. The values on it are not working together with the figure. It's possible I may need to move that now that I'm looking at it. Let's see. Get rid of these. Y'all painting anything fun these days? It's a little bit better. We need to fix the teeth. Ah, because the teeth are too perfect. Agreed. Okay. Just looking back to front. We might need to darken up this garbage just a touch, I think. It's always good, I think, to just peruse everything. When you come back to a painting after a little while, just peruse, see what needs doing. It's That's that whole coming back with fresh eyes thing, right? I'm warming up the shadows here. They got a little bit cool on me. That happens. It's all right. Okay. So I darkened this edge here because that value was being lost into the background and it wasn't, it wasn't really working for me. Yeah, I think it's better, a little bit darker. <clears throat> You're painting a portrait of two people as their wedding gift. Nice. Oh, they requested it. <laughs> that's great. Oh, man, that's fun. You're not talented enough to paint, but encouraging your young daughter. Ah, oh, anybody can paint. Didn't you watch that Ratatouille movie? Well, hopefully you get inspired in here and at some point decide to pick up a brush. We need you. Oh, you're re-watching the hand lessons, nice. That's good. I'm really glad those are helping you out. I need to go back and watch them myself sometimes. <laughs> oh no, what do we got here? Okay, no, this is the hand itself. Saying of which? I have to clean that up pretty significantly. Ooh, what are you? Okay. Hmm. I gotta tell you, gang, this week was a tough one. That this whole pandemic thing is starting to wear on me pretty heavy. Getting tired. I miss people, man. Never thought I would, but here I am. <laughs> it's just
Just wearing me down. You know what it is? It's the routine of it. You know, like, get up, eat, work, play video games. That's it. When I was a kid, that was like my dream. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my god. I dare not say that I'm tired of video games, but goddamn. I do live with people, yeah. Um, they're three elderly women. <laughs> um, it's it's a different vibe, you know. I did. I, I was living with primarily older folks when I was uh, cruising in Mexico, and then I started. That's why I actually decided to learn Spanish, was so I could just yank, hang out with people more my age. Um, so I'm, I'm used to it. It's not really a big deal. It's just like when that's it, you know, the conversations are, it's good just being able to talk to somebody. I feel bad really for people like in an apartment or something where there's nobody around. So I can't really complain. I actually have things really, really good. I just miss friends. That's all. Being a whiny little bitch. That's what I keep telling myself. Just stop being a whiny little bitch. Yeah, much better than completely alone, for sure. Do I think girls are more naturally artistic than boys? No, I don't think so. I think everybody's naturally an artist. Or has... Let me, let me rephrase that. I think everybody is naturally creative. And how that represents... Or how that presents is different. I think that you can be in the sciences and be creative. In fact, there's lots of... Um, Lots of research and lots of, of thinking that's gone into that that implies that any act of creation or any act of, of inventing something is creation. It's creative. So, you know, Einstein was a creative person. I'd say the only ones that don't really use it in the same way would be people that take it into, like, the market. But even then, I guess, you know, manipulation and things like that, it's all creative acts. But no, no, to answer your question, I don't think gender has anything to do with it. Or sex, or whatever. Avid, welcome. Turn Skype on. I actually tried, no one responded. <laughs> You're in the third lockdown in the UK. We're not even in our first. We haven't had a pro I mean, in Oregon, we have, uh, we are locked, we do have a lockdown in that, like, restaurants are not supposed to be open and things like that. But in the US, as you well know, we have not taken this thing very seriously. I guess old Boris hasn't really either. I don't know what it is about the right wingers and science denial. It's fucking crazy, man. Gotta get damn titties. <laughs> um, I just know better. Uh, there's loads of people. I mean, Oregon, where I live, Portland is a very sort of liberal city, but we're an an island and an ocean of uh, conservatism. So we have, I mean, not very far from where I live at all. We have whole towns where they're not locking down. You know, they're trying to keep restaurants open. 
you know, arcades are open, bars. So I don't know. It's you can't trust it because anybody that you happen to interact with, like if you're just going to go and get coffee, may be from one of those towns or has relatives that live in those towns. Kova, jackass. Know why she starts as soon as I start broadcasting. I think she just likes me yelling at her irritatedly. <laughs> it's her like Fifty Shades of Grey, little weirdo. Okay. Let's define some stuff that hasn't been worked on. So we got to work on these legs. I decided actually, I was thinking about it in the shower. I always paint goblins with these little loincloths. So I'm going to give them some shorts or something. A little pair of pants. Some denim. I don't know. You don't know me. She wants attention. I played with that dog for like an hour right before taking the shower. With, we have a little, it's like a, a fishing rod with a long line on it. And at the end of the line is like this little stuffy, like a, a plush skunk or something like that. That's like long and, and thin. And so I just lure her around with that. She chases that for, she'll chase it until she falls down. She loves that thing. So we played. She gets attention. You're just getting over COVID and it's so crazy contagious. Everyone who was there got it from the one person. Oh shit. What were you doing? Funder? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're getting over it though. God damn. Oh, she wants your attention. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't like to share. <laughs> yeah, shorts was the right decision. <laughs> and everyone that came into contact with you or anyone else that day also got it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're in the UK, or is it also Brazil? Where else they have the new or Australia also? They have the new strain. Scary stuff, man. How was your experience with it, uh, Funder? Did you come out uh, mostly asymptomatic? I'm pretty sure that I had the first round, like a lot of people, um, in January, I want to say, December, something like that. Um, <laughs> I had this random uh, hookup with a girl on a, on a boat that was in town. She was crewing on the boat, and we, we just made out. Um, but I got so sick. Um, That's the most sick I think I've ever been. Uh, I was in bed. I was unable to move uh, except for to go to the bathroom. I didn't eat or drink for like three days. That was crazy. God, I was so sick. 
And then I had a residual cough for like that following month and a half. It was like six weeks. It was, that was rough. You had it in March. You were really ill for two weeks with high fever. And then for one and a half weeks, you felt incredibly weak. Yeah, I was so weak. Just walking was rough, like walking the dog afterwards. Your husband and son were asymptomatic. That's good. <laughs> Play it, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all it was. That's also the night that I broke my phone. Because <laughs> I, I was in La Cruz, and then I had to get back to Puerto Vallarta. And I was at the marina, and, and I was on their boat. I had to get out of the marina, but in order to get out of marina, as well as get in, you have to have a key card, and I didn't have the key card. Um, so I had to try and scale the, <laughs> I had to scale the gate. And when I did it, um, my phone was in my pocket, and I it bumped, all it did was like the corner bumped a wall, and there was this like chink sound, and it's like, oh no. And yeah, so the top corner of it's all cracked, and fucked up. So. Lots of uh, mementos. <laughs> oh, total fail. <laughs> what am I, 11? <laughs> Come on now, that's adventure right there. That's the good stuff. Oh, she had it. Um, she actually, three people on that vessel were like dog sick and for several weeks prior to them arriving to port. Um, I'm friends with the, the first mate and the captain. So I, I knew they were coming to port. We planned to hang out and, they, and everybody was going through this crazy sickness. And uh, so I left them alone for a couple of weeks. And then everybody was feeling better. So I was like, okay, cool, we'll go hang out. And then it just, you know, it wasn't a plan of, of making out, but that happened. And then I got super fucking sick too. And it was great, good times. And then after being that sick, and then the announcements of the, of, the pandemic actually were coming. I had a, I, I was lucky. I had a friend that uh, had, um, he's, he's like a hardcore, almost psychotic prepper. <laughs> not like the, not the right wing style, but just like, you know, he's, he's definitely all about the shit, the shit will hit the fan kind of type thing. And so he's regularly, uh, you know, I, I, talk to him and he tells me about the latest thing that's going to end the world and usually it's like uh-huh uh-huh uh -huh. no biggie and nothing ever pans out well he was actually on top of this one and was sending me stuff in december and so i of course dismissed it at first and then after i got super sick i was like no way this thing must be real and then i i prepped and locked down i was locked down in in puerto vallarta for three, four weeks before coming up here to the States. Was the makeout session worth it? No, <laughs> it was not in the long run. You had a hookup where you spilled water on a laptop and destroyed it. <laughs> yeah, for once his panic did pay off. But ironically, uh, so he... He had everything ready. This is the craziest shit. He had everything ready. And then, you know, right around when I left to left uh, Mexico to come back to the States, he went to a rural part of California where his family's at so that he could get away from the city. And he was out there for a couple of months. I mean, he was one of the first people to self quarantine and self lockdown that I know a lot of other people, I mean, we have a lot of shared friends and, and a lot of those people just kind of laugh at him and ignore him. I'm basically the only one that really listens to his kooky shit. 
and now I'll definitely listen a little bit more, but uh, he went out there and, and self quarantined and then he went cabin, he went full cabin fever after a while and then went back to LA. <laughs> so for all of his bluster and fuss, he ended up not, uh, he ended up not sticking to it, which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah, that's the way. Gotta put the fill light in them cast shadows, gang. That's where it belongs. Doomsday preppers don't have to be super right wing. No, they don't. That's true. He just happens to not be one of those. I mean, being... Having now lived on the boat, that kind of mentality seems pretty natural to me. Not necessarily doomsday prepping, but prepping anyway. Like having, you know, having tools ready, flashlights, you know, water. Just backup stuff. Because this is really common things that you need to think about when you live on a boat. <clears throat> and when you're sailing around, you got to think about survival stuff. So it's not that unusual to me now. I'm just amused that he couldn't stick to it. <laughs> Which I think is going to be the case for a lot of people, you know? If this thing were to get worse, if we're talking like real world-ending scenario where, you know, the banks shut down and, and the internet goes out and the electricity's off, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to lose their shit. And many of them will be preppers. Because they may be functionally ready for it, Psychologically, it's a whole other business to be on your own. Believe me, I know. <clears throat> I like San Diego. I like LA too. Can I work fully at sea? Yeah. Um, I can, and I was working at sea, I just can't do internet stuff at sea. The internet is very difficult to keep going out there. Oh, no, not satellite. Uh, I would use uh, uh, cell service when I had it, or I would just go in, into coffee shops and, and use the local Wi-Fi. Satellite internet is insanely expensive. They have satellite internet, and what they'll do is, like, they just use that to send emails. You know what I mean? Or text messages. They don't use that for watching Netflix and shit because it's crazy expensive. It's like $1,500 a month or some shit. And that's not counting the cost of the hardware. Oh, he's got more than three. <laughs> yeah, Funder, that's basically how it worked. Provision, um, send out uh, any files I needed to send out or collect files I needed to collect. And then support. That's only for big stuff. But I mean, it could, it could be a nightmare too. There, there's the mythic tale of... Uh, the 52 gigabyte file that I had to do once where I spent eight hours a day for eight days uh, in a coffee shop uh, uploading. That was a fucking nightmare. Downloading, rather. Uh, 
had switched brushes. Just a little more variety in here. <clears throat> Not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I need to figure out these hands and the legs. Nope, I hate this hand, so I'm not going to noodle it. What we're going to do is merge this stuff down, and I'm just going to erase this bitch because I can't stand it. So what are we going to do instead? Let's think about this. He lives in a realm where there's sticks that glow with magic. I'm not particularly worried about the physics of his uh, spindly legs. <laughs> I much prefer creatures. Creatures and effects <clears throat> are my favorite. Characters are fun. I love doing the Planeswalker stuff. Those are always entertaining. I usually like things like this where the format is different because a lot of the times when you're working on magic cards, the format is horizontal. It's like a landscape. So trying to show character action or emotion in a, you know, a two inch image that's also horizontal. So everything's squished down. It's, it's always a challenge. And I, I imagine this is probably true for most of the artists is like after a while you keep you've been painting at that format and that size for so long that your um, compositions start to feel like mundane and similar all the time. Okay. Yeah, I dig that too. I think I may have overdone it with these wrinkles up here.
Calendar, welcome. Glad you could join. Is drawing for Watsi my main gig? No. Uh, doing art for uh, Wizards of the Coast has been a like super tiny side gig almost the entirety of my working with them. Uh, I, when I first started with them, I was working at Neversoft, the uh, video game studio that did Tony Hawk. I was working on a Western called Gun. And then I did uh, a bunch of Tony Hawk games too, even though I didn't sign up for that. And after that was Sony. No, they, they've, they kind of have been a great gap fill uh, and also a sort of an escape from my regular work, especially when I was working on Tony Hawk, because you can only paint so many versions of hoodies and jeans before you start wanting to tear your head, your hair out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was a, it was a welcome relief then. And then as I started working on more fantasy stuff, doing things that I really like, uh, it wasn't as necessary and became a little bit more of a chore for a while. And then when I went out on the boat, then it was like, kind of a saving grace again because there were some tight months where that was all I had. Fortunately, out of the years I was out at sea, that was pretty rare. Even living abroad and difficult to, to uh, contact, I was able to get contract work, which was great. I did some film work and some game design. I even wrote, did some writing. And then I worked on my own projects. That's really what the boat thing was about, was just to like work on my own stuff. So I wrote some screenplays, some stories, did a comic, it was great. Mitchin, thanks, appreciate that. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3, I don't think so. I think my first Tony Hawk was the one before, I think it's the one before American Wasteland. I think that was my first Tony Hawk game. And I, I can't remember for the life of me the name of it. Because I did, while I was there, I was only at Neversoft for like two years, three years. And uh, I did so many Tony Hawk games. <laughs> I was a concept artist though, so I didn't do any of the design stuff. I decided to make him a little bit muscular in the arms to make him look like, uh, you know, he's a, he is the king of the garbage dump. I'm gonna leave it a little bit chunky because I think uh, it's gonna be a nice support for the detail of the face. see those nails I have to move the hand again because it's just not working let's see Yeah, I think that'll be a little better. <clears throat> I 
Benino, thank you for that follow. Appreciate that. Is it true the main character of Gun is done after Wesley Burt? Uh, yeah, I think that's probably pretty true. Uh, Wesley was doing a lot of the concept art before I got onto the game. And uh, the characters that he did were kind of his own, of his own making. I mean, they're really good. I remember being quite impressed with the drawings. Uh, he was working largely in pencil. I mean, he could paint, but he was doing all of his concept art in pencil, which was just unheard of at the time. And I was like, this guy's amazing. And then uh, I saw a picture of him later and we were like, oh my God, <laughs> he just made himself the main character. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. That was funny. Ballsy, got to give him credit. <laughs> We didn't know what he looked like. He was in San Francisco at the time, I think, with uh, Massive Black. Oops. Okay, I'm on a different layer here. So when you say done, done after, he did it himself. Just to clarify, we didn't, uh, we didn't design it to look like him. <laughs> For this portrait commission, you did an exercise of applying different lighting scenarios from the lessons. Awesome. How did it go? Are you not posting on the Discord because it's a secret? <laughs> All right, that's fair. Well, hopefully we can see it eventually. We're all fans of Arena on the Discord. <clears throat> so I had the lighting from a different uh, arrangement, so I have to change all of this now. Hmm. I'm inclined to just leave the hand in shadow, even though it doesn't really make sense. Maybe there's a cast shadow that we can follow up this way. Just doing this with a chunky, hard edge round. Um, I usually use this brush when I want to make some big decisions, and I don't care about like that final look of it. I know this works the way it was. Trying really hard to mi mimic soft feel of Melanie DeLons. I'll never get there, but trying to understand how she does it. I am not familiar with who that is. Um, I'd love for you to post her work on the Discord, though, so we can check it out. It's another thing I love about fantasy. Getting tired of, tired of trying to figure out some uh, foreshortening on a forearm. Just throw a gauntlet on it. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Lazy is the way. Tired of fighting this dumb thing. Gauntlet. Boom. Showing you guys how the sausages are made. Ha! <laughs> You didn't find the videos on my page, only streams and old ones. Uh, are you talking about the YouTube page or here on on uh, Twitch? Oh, oh, Irina's, I see, gotcha. Oh, nope, mine, shit. Yeah, the, all of the lessons that Irina's talking about are on the gum road. Ouch. Um, we use the we use the Discord for critique, um, just general sharing of cool art related stuff, game related stuff, whatever. Um, we don't really have challenges on there. I'm not opposed to having them, but I think what I'll have to do is is uh, have a mod uh, handle that. <laughs> Hi, Donkers. Welcome. Thanks. You posted uh, Melanie Delon's uh, gaming painting on game painting on Discord. Awesome. Can't wait to check that out. I watched <clears throat> all of those uh, behind the scenes things that I posted uh, on the Discord for Klaus. And uh, man, so good. What an amazing team. And then I tried, I've done for the day job, uh, my art direction gig, I'm. Uh, I'm pushing for a stylized, so that's that was my primary motivation for getting into it. And so I've done a couple of paintings now, kind of in that style. It's awesome, it's so fun. I am not naturally uh, leaning towards the stylized looking stuff. <clears throat> By stylized, I mean that kind of really, really soft uh, Blair animation look. Um, so it was a fun challenge. It was really good. And it came out not bad. I think it comes down to my weaknesses as a designer. I'm, I'm much stronger with painting and realizing light and form. And then I struggle with design more. Shape language, that sort of thing. 
I know the rules and can follow the rules, but it's just so much easier for me to just start making light. Just different paths to the same solution, ultimately. Is Raru Lawinski, Lawinski. Thank you so much for the uh, the follow there. Diver Fiction. I am painting a painting. Uh, this is a redesign of a magic card that I did a while ago called the Gutter Snipe. So I'm doing the same, I used the same um, assignment so all of the, the same description and everything. I'm just changing the orientation of the camera, changing the character, and trying to get a slightly different narrative out of it. It's a fun little exercise here. Am I doing actual uh, person I know? Yes. This is a uh, portrait of my father. Right there. A very handsome gentleman. <laughs> I don't have any respect for him. <laughs> oh, thanks, Donnie. Glad you like it. That's our sky fill. Skyfill can only live in the shadows. Here's a little hand trick that uh, I've been working with pretty frequently. When it comes to the fingers, I'll try and draw them out so that there's basically just two joints and then I just split the last one. Um, if, if I need to move it, I'll move it, but that usually most of the work can be done just by smoothly doing two, just one knuckle, so that's the knuckle of the hand, one knuckle to the main and then to the nail there. And it's seems to be working pretty well. See, the rhythms are just, it's just two tubes, but uh, that last one we can, we can divide, not quite in half, but almost in half.
Am I bored of compliments yet? <laughs> Wonder how to decide truly if something one produces is good or bad. Do you mean for yourself? Or judging like other work outside of yourself? See, this is the problem with these damn hands, is I keep running into fucking tangencies. Did it again. Yeah, that's a big question. If you compliment someone that's relative to what you've seen is something you can make. Hmm. Like, do you think, are you, are you kind of implying that, that the only people that would compliment you are people that can't do what it is that you're doing? Because that is, I mean, that's actually not an uncommon personal philosophy, um, but I would have, I would advise against it because then it kind of, it automatically implies this sort of ranking and, and it changes what compliments can mean. Like you can value something without being a mass, or uh, you can value something while being a master of that thing. Um, and you don't want to diminish that. I think uh, if something genuinely moves you and you want to share a positive opinion on it, then there's nothing wrong with that. And it's not at all like, I, I don't think that there's any um, inherent, what's the word I'm looking for? There's there's not any inherent statement about the complimenter's quality or the, the person receiving it, their quality. It's just... It's just a sharing of an experience and, and appreciation for it. That's all. And try not to think much more of it than that. I, I say this because I used to think this way too, really. Um, like uh, when I was in school in particular, I had my head up my own ass quite a bit. And um, my thinking was like, oh, well, it doesn't matter if somebody compliments you that's not that it isn't of quality, then then it's not a real thing. It doesn't matter. They don't even know what it is I'm doing, that sort of shit. And as I grew up and became less of an asshat, I realized that it is, it is experiential and it is subjective. And while I definitely cherish uh, compliments from uh, peers or betters, I think that all, all they're all valuable. Because that that subjective experience is valid. Period. You're a person and experiencing something, and I contributed to that in some way, and that's special. I get I get where you're coming from. I totally do. Um, don't don't overthink it. Just just be in the moment and enjoy what you can enjoy. And if you can share in it, all the better. That's my philosophy now. <laughs> I don't know why his pants have a belt loop. He's got the cutoffs. He's a never nude.
Yeah. Overthinking is kind of, that's the core root of, I'd, I'd imagine, just about everybody's problems. Just overthinking shit. From my perspective, the biggest problem with overthinking isn't just that, you know, it can be destructive, but that it's ultimately a waste of the only resource that you've got. So you have a very limited amount of time on this planet. Very limited. It's probably ideal to spend as much of it having fun and, and uh, enjoying things and people and interactions as you can sitting and obsessing about that thing or about the past and about the future or what it may bring is going to be a waste of that life when you're working through my hand lesson your nine-year-old son was next to you the schools are closed every time <laughs> I said phalange, you both cheered because it's an English thing. <laughs> oh, I see. Just because I repeated it so much. <laughs> well, it was the it was the appropriate word. We're certainly making his little spindly legs look like they can handle that weight now, eh? <laughs> Let's uh, grab this here. Oops. Just want that overlap. Let's add some more goodies here. Let's do maybe a belt or something. That can't be right. Okay, I didn't think so. Some pouches. You gotta have them fantasy pouches filled with coin and chicken wings. <laughs> I got to be careful though cuz I'm by adding these details I'm I'm changing his scale and he's getting bigger and bigger cuz I'm giving him small small details so I need something I really got to think of something that goes on him that would make it clear maybe I'll have to change the crown into something recognizable but make it clear that he's small you know like under 4 feet tall Maybe four feet is, is a good height. Mm. Coffee. Your husband walked in and said he didn't know it was even a word. Really? <laughs> That's great. Zero cool. Thank you so much for that follow. Appreciate that. You only knew it from friends. If you know the episode when Phoebe tells people on the plane that the plane doesn't have a phalange. I have seen one episode of Friends, I will be honest with you. One episode, and it was like hot, hot torture. I did not enjoy it. <laughs> it was not for me. Friends, How I Met Your Mother, these are just not, they're not Izzy shows. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it is good that it taught you the word phalange. I like that. <laughs> Chicken wing patch. Yes, it's related to phalanx. They're, uh, phalanx, I think, is the origin word. Oh, Latin. <laughs> We know that phalanx is a, uh, it's 
a a branch not a branch i'm sorry but a, a formation a military formation a line or a row I don't know where he got such fancy pouches, but we'll just let him have it. Should just be plastic trash bags, but <laughs> it doesn't quite work, does it? I love etymology, which is the origin of words. It's such an interesting subject to learn how language evolved. <laughs> Loot from his victims, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I learned a lot of, through Latin, I've learned the origin of a lot of interesting things. Like the term decimated, that comes, that's a Latin origin, which is also military in origin. I think he's learned that one, to decimate. I think in, in modern, modern language, it means to destroy, like utterly destroy something. And uh, its origin is in a form of punishment. The de to decimate would have been uh, if the soldiers had done something, if, if, let's say, someone was caught stealing, then in order to ensure that uh, they wouldn't uh, do it again, the punishment would involve punishing a random selection of people. So that in, the, in that way, this is actually very clever, you wouldn't want to commit a crime when you were in the ranks of the Roman legion uh, because by committing the crime, you not only would you be punished, but in all likelihood, your friends would as well, or people that you don't know, and then they would punish you. But to decimate would be to take 10 of a number, deci, right? Like decimal, a 10th. Take, take 10 of a number, or one of, one of every 10, something like that, and then they were the ones that were punished. That's how they were chosen. Shit's crazy cakes. You find that every time you say something more than a few times, it starts to sound weird. I've definitely had that. Pot may or may not have been involved on a couple of those occasions. <laughs> Just talking is weird. Conveying thought, like inaccurately through words is a really weird concept. I don't wanna overwork those. I will add a highlight to them later, but not yet. Game Shark Blue, thank you for that follow. Welcome. There's a term for that when a word is spoken so many times it loses its meaning. Yeah, I, I think there is. I don't remember what it is, though. But it does remind me of another interesting word, which is the opposite of deja vu. Deja vu is uh, when something foreign or uh, unknown feels familiar, right? The opposite of that is jamais vu which is when you come home and home doesn't seem right. That's a cool one too. I remember ex the first time I really experienced that, I was coming back to LA after being abroad for, I think it was, I was gone for like two and a half months on a round the world tour. Uh, back then, 
the student travel agency, which I think is represented in every country, but started in the US maybe, where they offer special deals and discounts for students and teachers. And uh, I, through the student, student travel agency, I was able to hook up a round the world ticket, which was like $1,000 for eight stops. It was amazing. But I was gone so long that when I got back, I remember flying over LA and being like, huh, this is weird. And then I got home and everything was alien. I mean, it was familiar, but alien. It was weird as hell. Very uncomfortable. Semantic satiation. Interesting. <laughs> it's because you've jumped realities. It's the... Uh, uh, shit, what's it called? The Mandela effect. I was familiar with that, uh, with the Mandela effect. I had I had done some reading on it, and I found it, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting. And then one time, I remember, I ended up matching on one of those dating sites with this woman in uh, Canada, randomly, and we started talking. And she was super into it. She totally believed that she was from an alternate timeline. And uh, she really, really wanted to convince me that uh, that this was the case. And I was like, well, this is really interesting stuff. Go, go ahead and I'll listen, you know. I invited the uh, Jehovah's Witness in to explain everything to me. Because every now and then it's just interesting to hear other people's perspectives on things. So I, ta I talked to her for like a couple of weeks and just downloaded all of this crazy information. And she started sending me these YouTube links of these people that believe it. And I started to realize that a lot of the people that follow that as like a, a hard truth are using it as basically like an, a, a get out of jail free card. <laughs> like anytime they've done something that is lamentable, then they're like, oh, that that was from a different timeline. That's not really me. <laughs> it's like, oh, OK, I see what's going on here. <laughs> But I did, I did actually have to full on stop talking to her, like where I was really like, oh my God, this is not, this is not good. So she was convinced that, uh, for example, her blood type was different in her previous dimension. That was one of the things that was like her big tell is that she knew that her blood type was something, was something that it's not, that the doctors here have tested for. And I was like, okay, well, you know, be careful with that. And then she said that with her kids, uh, she told her kids that they're from a different timeline. And I was like, uh, I got to step out on that one. When you're fucking with the reality of children, uh, that's a no-go for old Izzy. Not cool. Very not cool. I mean, that's the shit that they do to those poor kids that end up in cults and stuff, you know, convincing them that they're going to be future Jeebus or whatever. It's really sad. Then it was no longer amusing. Cap and Izzy had to fucking bounce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Slowly back away. I mean, it's compelling because we have all experienced uh, collective misremembering on some level or another. Um, so it's a very, it's a very compelling idea. And there is, there is logic that implies that it's possible. I mean, for example, it's almost at this point a given that. Uh, parallel dimensions exist. Um, so I get it. I get wanting to believe in it for sure. It's interesting. But uh, if it functionally harms how you're living now, then that religion, philosophy, whatever is possibly dangerous. And if it's fucking up kids, then it's extremely dangerous and I don't approve of it. Generally, I don't give a shit what people believe, but if it's harming kids, that's an out. Nope. You remember Pikachu having a, a dark tail? Um, I think it was Raichu that had the dark tail, right? Yeah, the most common the most common one for Americans in particular is the Berenstein Bears. Uh, Mandela effect where everybody remembers it as as Baron Stain like a bear, like it's uh, S T E I N 
And it's like really common. Even I remembered it that way, that it was Berenstein. And I'm, even we pronounce it that way, Berenstein Bears. Like it was a, a slightly uh, Jewish sounding name, Berenstein. Um, and I always thought that was just part of part of what it was. Turns out, nope. It's, it, not only is it pronounced differently, it is spelled completely differently. It's stain, like a stain in your clothes. Okay, now I have to actually account for this thing. I really fucked up this anatomy here. Boy, this is tough with two strong light sources. I don't want this to draw the eye more than the rest, so I'm gonna knock down, I think, the fill light just a touch. I'll let the fill light come out on the foot. There's a little creepy hoof there. Oh, we might have to change that all together. You know what, we're gonna change it. This is a redraw situation, just like the hand. I just have it torqued out too far and it doesn't feel accurate to how he'd be placing his weight. This is a common mistake I make. I, I try to go for like a, a heroic pose and just overdo it like, you know, 20% too much. I'm going to merge all of these down again. I don't know why I'm making him so beefy. I'm going to make him spindly legged again. I think there's this, there's this impulse uh, anatomically, because a lot of the big guys that I've known, um, they, they got really big. Uh, ladies too, their calves and legs, because they're carrying around so much extra weight, get super strong and, and thick. And I'm actively working against that for the contrast, because it's funny. Contrasts of expectation. So, okay, this is the other problem I'm realizing. This one, I have his knee is right at the base of the thing, so it's actually anatomical. What I've done is totally wrong. Adelheide, hi, how's it going? Welcome. Looney Tunes, the Mandela effect is weird. For Looney Tunes, really? What's the Looney Tunes Mandela effect? What do we collectively misremember? I see what you're saying. That's right. Well, it's that's a logic one too because you would you would believe that it's cartoons, tunes, but when they first came out it was all uh music short musical numbers, right? 
That makes perfect sense. I forgot the word for that that as well. There, I just learned this too. There's a word for like when people misphrase because they've misheard um, common idioms, like uh, for all intensive purposes and things like that. There's a word for that. It's because and and essentially it's it's a thing that's become common because it's logical. Like it's a logical mistake. And if you think about any of those, um, and I, of course, those are uh, pet peeves of mine when people misuse those, which is a stupid thing to do when you understand that language evolves, but I do it anyway. Um, <laughs> but the, the phrasing of it just makes sense. How far in advance before a card is released do you do the art? Um, it's usually a year. I've had it be shorter, but that's very rare. So the cards I'm working on now, you won't see until probably November at the soonest. Or Jerry Rig, yeah. What are they, the cards I'm working on now? I am painting a uh, Godzilla. Lots of Godzilla paintings. Scooby Doo. I'm doing the magic version of Scooby Doo. <laughs> Am I being obstinate? Yes. I can't tell you that stuff. That is a very quick and easy way to lose your job. <laughs> I was a part of an uh, of an actual an accidental contract break that happened. Oops, that's on the wrong layer. Uh, years ago, when I was working at Sony. And they were working on a game called Little Big Planet, which was sort of like a, you, it's a 2D platformer with really cute, super soft looking 3D puppet characters. Yeah. And so uh, there's this shot of me that went around on Kotaku and all of the sites, like it was this big to do. I had lawyers called on me and all sorts of shit. But what had happened was, um, I'll, t I'll tell you the story from my end. I was sitting, I was sitting at my desk and I was working and I had fallen asleep like this and I was painting and my, one of my friends took a picture of me while I was like, like right as I woke up, I managed to look up right as he took the picture. And it was just funny because he caught me sleeping on the job and uh, no, no big deal there. The problem was, is that behind me on foam core were these uh, concept art paintings of the Kratos version of Sackboy, the little puppet. And so he had his little sword and his little stripe and he looked all surly and that hadn't been released that we were doing a God of War um, uh, Easter egg for Little Big Planet. And so that got out like because he put it on uh, he'd put it on his Twitter or something like that. And then s some fan got a hold of it and then it just boom, it went like wildfire, like <gasps> Kratos is going to be in Little Big Planet, blah, blah, blah. And it was this whole thing. And unfortunately, yours truly was featured like right in the middle of the shot, like all. <laughs> totally half awake looking like shit <laughs> very embarrassing so yeah uh it went around i got called by the studio head i got called by lawyers they were like so who took the picture who put it up who took the picture who took the picture i was like i don't know i told them that like uh whoever took it like caught me like half awake like i, I was i had fallen asleep. i just i fell on my sword to protect my friend said i didn't know who it was i'm super sorry i, I don't know what happened 
called him, told him to take it down immediately. He took it down. So all was good. I didn't get in any trouble about it. But yeah, we unintentionally uh, released the information too soon. So yeah, other people, I, this has definitely happened where you've done, where people have done it, um, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, but definitely broke the rules and they lose their jobs. Or worse, you can be sued. Uh, terrible things can happen. So you got to be very careful about your NDA. The cards I'm working on. Literal Godzilla. No, I'm teasing you. Was it actually a Godzilla crossover? I thought it was just like big monsters. Anyway, is there any young age-wise artist whose work I really admire? Young age-wise... Um, you know, honestly, I see so much work that's incredible. Um, you go on on ArtStation, you're going to find all sorts of good stuff. And, I mean, the vast majority of them are kids right out of school or they're still in school and they're incredible. But I am really, really bad about remembering the names of artists. So once I see the art, if I ever see it again, I'll recognize that art. But for some reason, I'm really, really bad with names. This has been a constant uh, problem for me. I'm, I'm that way even... Even, you know, places of work. I remember names con contextually. That's the best way. So if I'm in a workplace, I can memorize over time the names of everybody I'm working with. But if I see them at a mall that's away from work, I can't remember their name. And then I feel really embarrassed about it. It gives me severe social anxiety. But yeah, I have a real problem with names. Um, it's awful. So yeah, get on get on uh, ArtStation. There's tons. I can't give you a name though. NDAs. That's right. Was Stephen Fry narrating? Which one? Was, oh, the uh, the documentary. Wait, what was Stephen Fry narrating? What did I miss? It's Godzilla M O T G. Trying to turn down a ceiling fan with little hands. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, it really shouldn't be a big deal. Like, I, I had a, I had a little nap sitting up. I was literally like this with my hand on the thing, just like I had just zonked. It happens, you know. If you're gonna fire me over that, well, that's not a place I want to work. <laughs> yeah, I worked on uh, God of War. I worked actually. I started on God of War three. Uh, I came in right at the end, like they had just done the launch party for God of War 2 when I joined. So I did God of War 3, and then I was lead concept artist on God of War Ascension. I was on my post-lunch nap. No, it was like really early in the morning. <laughs> they got the Godzilla IP and did a full-blown crossover. That's funny. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. No, that's not what I'm working on. Little big oh little big planet that's right I forgot that Stephen Fry did the narrating on the first one did they did he do the narrating on the rest because I never played the other ones just the first one I got a copy because of Kratos in there start calling everybody buddy they'll think you're friendly that's basically my workaround but I mean it's I feel like everybody knows that if you're just calling them friendo that they know you know you don't remember their name. Also, it's an unconscious thing. I've definitely seen it. When I remember somebody's name and, and it's been a while and I say their name, their face lights up in a different way. Like there's this expectation that you don't remember the name. And when you do, it's like a delicious surprise. So it's worth it. And I, tr I really try. And I can hold on to names. I'd say I, I, I have what I call goldfish memory. So my I can remember well, like maybe the last three years and then everything beyond that just kind of gets foggy unless people are talking about it or unless there's a specific story. So it's like this big catalog of things that are behind me. And then I'll remember something when there's an opportunity to tell a story. And so then I'll remember that bit and then I'll remember it in vivid detail, tell the story and then that's it. But I can't give you details like names for some reason. That's just one of those things I don't do. If I can't sleep on the job, that's not the job I want. Damn right. <laughs> you remember being mesmerized with the God of War Ascension demo when it came out? Awesome. Yeah, I worked really hard for that demo. Yeah, Stephen Fry is awesome. He's so great. All right, let's finish this up. Let's keep talking, though.
think let's give him inky feats. He's been crawling around in the garbage. Makes perfect sense. You remember faces? That's good. I, I'm, I'm great with faces, paintings, art. That's fine, but I cannot, I can't remember the names. Like I kind of, in a way, I kind of mentally take pictures of people's faces. And so it's really not uncommon at all for people's faces to show up in my paintings, um, especially if I've seen them a lot. So if you look through my paintings, totally unintentionally, I end up painting actors and things like that. Because it's just their facial rhythms that I, I know well. Um, especially when I'm painting out of my head. But ask me their names. No dice. time hour and a half okay your son and I, uh, your son and you are listening to the Harry Potter Harry Potter audio narration so amazing he is a national treasure I do not disagree but personally Jim Dahl is way better in my opinion than Stephen Fry his voices are amazing <laughs> I've listened to the Jim Dahl audio book of uh, the Harry Potter series so many times. Do I know that Kratos is in Fortnite now? I think I heard about that, yeah. <laughs> yes, IP crossovers are very popular. This is true. Didn't they just do the, they did the Mandalorian too, right? I think I saw that in one of those YouTube ads. Hmm. This foot is not bringing me joy, let me tell you. about what we contrasted against.
Uh, yeah, Jim Dahl, uh, D A H L, I think is his name, D- or maybe it's Dale. Jim Dale? No. He's another English performer, and he does. He won, or he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for most audiobook voices in a single series, and that's for Harry Potter because he's a different voice for everybody. Um, so, like, even before they, even before you get to the Hermione says, you know, Jim Dale, yeah, is who said it, and it, he's so good. His voices are incredible. Stephen Fry is just a presence, though. I mean, it's really hard to compete. Let me save this real quick. That's already saved. How has my painting process changed over doing these illustrations? Has there been methods you've dropped or new ones added? That's a good question. Um, I think when I first started traditional or started painting for magic, uh, I had a really heavy emphasis on painting in the traditional way. And uh, the things that I've adopted are definitely more the concept art, um, shortcuts, things like that. I've implemented 3D in a couple of pipelines, things things along those lines. I, I think overall, though, that's just how my art's been changing over time as I become less of a, a um, purist. Holy shit, I just realized my hair is doing this. That is not cool, man. Stop doing that. Go away, little man. Why didn't you guys tell me it was doing that? <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> Does the games, how does the game industry view Fortnite? I mean, I don't represent the game industry by any stretch. I am in it, but I couldn't, I couldn't argue for anybody else. I think, uh, it's basically the way we view any game that becomes ultra popular is there's this kind of impulse to see what they did right, what they do wrong, and then build from that. Like it's, there's very much a, from the developer side, maybe the money side is different, but from the developer side, there's very much a joy in people's success and then trying to figure out how to do it as well. I do know that when uh, when Epic tried to pull away from Apple, that became kind of a big, that was quite a laugh for everybody because Epic just wanted to do what Apple was doing. <laughs> so like they tried to portray themselves as this underdog when they were massively wealthy as well. It's an interesting it's an interesting discussion to have like how how should gaming be monetized how should gaming be distributed distributed um how does the monopoly work with that it's a very it's it's an interesting but terse discussion that needs to continue happening so i'm glad that they're having that conversation now i don't dis- despise fortnite i've never played it I have no desire to play it. I have other shooters that I like. I have other uh, even battle royales that I like. Just it's not not for me. But I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna give anybody crap for something that they enjoy. They both just they both just did uh, Walking Dead crossovers. That's funny. Have I ever been asked to teach at CGMA or Schoolism, Irina? Um, CGMA I actually taught at when they first got started. I have character lessons on there from way back. I did uh, eight episodes. It was my very first time actually documenting my teaching at all. Um, But that was short-lived. I only did maybe two or three terms there. I did not, (laughs) ironically, I did not like the uh, being on video and doing the critiques. (laughs) I much prefer teaching in person. I really do much prefer teaching in person with a good crowd. That's an important uh, caveat, but um, I don't know. At the time, it just felt really, if, if I had people there and I could interact on a personal level, I would rather do that. And then, you know, when I went to go and move on the boat, that's when I first started the Patreon and started doing lessons. And it was because I knew that I wouldn't, I would be very limited in my contact with people. So you can kind of, you can kind of trace my reasoning for everything all the way through. So what did I say about that gauntlet? Because we're going to do that right now. Oosh. <laughs> cheating, cheating. <laughs> How 
How often do I save the piece I'm working on? Um, it's, at, it's an impulse now. I have it set to a shortcut key. So it's a macro. It's just, I just press one button and it saves. I'd say I save it almost every two minutes or so. And I'm guessing that's my frequency. So you guys can time me if you want. So I'll save it now. And I'll try and remember to let you know when I save it again unconsciously. We'll, we'll see if I can remember that. But I'll try. Oops. I have a selection on. That's why. I look like Superman. <laughs> I've had people ask me if I'm trying to do that. And I think that's why I've become self-conscious about my hair when it does that. Is because I've had people tease me about like trying to look like Superman. And I'm not. It's just... I don't fuck with my hair. I wash it and don't look in the mirror. <laughs> I've had people ask like why my hair is so different every time I'm on Twitch. That's why right there is because it does whatever it wants to do. <laughs> You're only here for the little curlies? Oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, it's totally ironic. Do I think CGMA is a good school? Depends on the instructor. Um, I think CGMA is fine. It's a fine establishment. They're cool, really cool people. Um, I, I, I'm particularly fond of a, a couple of the team there. They're, they were very sweet um, and understanding about my choice to leave and things like that. Um, I don't know what it's like now, but I will always say that it's not really the organization, it's the teacher. So a good teacher, I just saved, a good teacher is going to be worth their weight of go weight in gold, regardless of the institution that they're with. So if you can find good teachers at CGMA, CGMA is a great school. If you can find good teachers at CGA or uh, 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 CAD, same thing, uh, CDA rather. Uh, same thing with Art Center. I mean, I had good teachers and I had bad teachers when I was there. I had some phenomenally bad teachers when I was at Art Center. And Art Center is considered one of the, like, top art schools in the U.S. So, that was 90 sec seconds? Yeah. That's how often. <laughs> oh, Funder. If, if I could get women to swoon over me putting together a computer, I would wear my hair like that all the time. <laughs> Exactly, Kellender. I, I think there's more important things than what I look like. Michael Hampton taught at CGMA. David, you just got hired as concept artist for full time at a major studio. Hey, congrats. That's great, my man. Well done. Looking forward to finding out who with. Do you know what kind of uh, concept art you'll be doing? Are you going to be generalist? Characters? I remember you were doing everything. <laughs> Thanks for the shout out, David. David's been working for a long time trying to get, get in. So that's, uh, that's great news. I'm going to get this warmth into the foot, otherwise it's going to look like it's falling off. Oops, overdid that stroke there. Saved again. Whoa, really? Huh, I guess so. Wow. K 
character concept artist. That's great. Can't afford it, but keep dreaming of Melanie Dillon's class where you already have a lot of the theory. Well, it doesn't hurt. I, I think, uh, you know, you probably won't hear this from many teachers, but I think it's a great thing to get your education from a very wide source. Lots of different teachers, lots of different perspectives, because um, we all have our own biases and um, we all have weak spots. And I try to be pretty straightforward with you guys with my weak spots and biases so that you know what you're getting. Um, some teachers, I've had teachers myself that have kind of written their method as the be and end all. And, um, you know, as I learned more and studied from more people, I realized that that's, that there's a lot of different ways to do similar things and that the philosophies underlying how we approach image making and storytelling through image, it's, it can be as varied as, as the stars, my man. So I wouldn't, I would, I would do it if you can, you know? Yeah, I don't like landscapes. They don't feature heavily in my paintings. That's true. I'm also a profoundly lazy painter. Oh, the sliders for materials, David? Yeah, that was a good uh, good reference. I cover that in the materials class. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, I started playing with Blender this this last year and I started to learn you know, a little bit about making materials and shaders and things like that and seeing how it was straight up just a slider. You know, it was fun to to have that knowledge. You just have to learn the vernacular for whatever something means, like what luster is in painting versus what it is in 3D. Once you got that, it's cakey times. Where are you? I know you're here somewhere, you little bastard. Ah, there you are. Hmm. This is bothering me, so I gotta do something about it now. Wait, why are you ha- oh. That's a multiply layer? What the what? Oh, I see, okay. little tangent here, but this was annoying me. I had to do it. Okay, let's go back to our figure. Yeah, uh, David, everybody's brains work differently and they problem solve in different ways. So that's important. I think that's one of the qualifiers for a great teacher is, is somebody that can explain the same concept in a myriad different ways, just so that every person can be up to speed at the same level. So the more ways that you can explain something, the better. I think it's a, a really v valuable tool for a teacher. She's got a CGMA course and you love her work, but all the students' work shown on her page is very poor. Really? It could be that maybe she's not a, a, an excellent teacher, but, so what I was just saying about teachers with, um, with their qualities for uh, teaching in regard to telling things in different ways, there is another way around that. If you run into a teacher that is difficult in, in terms of conveying things, you can put on your um, your client hat and treat them like a client or an art director and try to 
sort of needle the things you need out of them uh, by asking better questions. So there is another way that you could learn from someone like that. If, if that's the case, I'm not saying she's a bad teacher. I'm using her as an example. That's totally unfair. I don't know her work and I don't know how she teaches. But if you do run into a teacher that is not, you know, top notch in communication, then it's up to you to get what you need out of it. Because you're right, that shit's expensive, man. Fucking expensive. The sliders helped lots because your understanding of how lighting works is largely bolstered by 3D modeling. Oh, good. Saved again. Okay, so you paint like you like you would render. Yeah, that's basically kind of how I do it too. Yeah. You were a texture painter years ago and have implemented render passes into the approach. Oh, good. That's actually a really good way of thinking about light is is like render passes, just like you would do in 3D. That's that's pretty clever. Um, Scott Robertson teaches it that way, and it's. I think he's a pretty solid teacher about that stuff. That's actually where I learned how to approach materials in the recipe fashion was from Scott. I changed it up pretty significantly from how he teaches it, but the core concept of uh, basically just doing layers of what the different effects of light do comes from the classes I took with him. And that's that. That's not working. That's a bit better. Yeah. Schoolism is more affordable, but other teachers there are, but other teachers there, amazing as they are. I think I'm missing half that sentence. Schoolism is pretty cool. I've looked into a couple of classes. I haven't taken any. I've done Udemy uh, and on a lot of Gumroads, but a lot of the Gumroads that I took, I ended up they ended up contributing to me doing my own Patreon was it, and I talk about it in the ad about how the Gumroads that I watched, I, you know, you they're like ten bucks themselves, and then they don't really teach anything. They just kind of like were like gimmicks, and that pissed me off so much. I had to make some of my own, where I actually teach you to paint. I get productive when I'm angry, I guess. <laughs> Oops. Uh, I think Scott still teaches at, at, uh, at Art Center, yes. 
I'm not 100% certain on that, though. Oh, Melanie Dillon is only at CGMA. I see, okay. Well, you could always just ask her for, to see if she would do a mentorship. That is one of those things. So like uh, my buddy, Peter, he started, he used to do, I'm not sure if he still works with CGMA, but he used to work for a lot of different online classes. And then he ended up just starting his own because ultimately he makes all the money. There's no middleman, which makes the most sense to me. So maybe if you approach her and ask if she'd be interested in a mentorship or something like that, a little bit more directly. Understanding maybe she doesn't have the time or whatever, but it might be worthwhile. Sam Nielsen teaches painting light in the same way as David's talking about. Nice. Nathan Folks is a great teacher, um, especially for, yeah, illustration, lighting. That he's, I would consider him a modern master for sure. He's a wizard with the traditional media as well. If you can get uh, classes with Rob Rupel, same thing. I am painting on garbage <laughs> on the figure layer. So I've definitely gotten to that stage where I can technically just paint on any layer now. Hmm. One or the other, it's gotta go light or dark. It just can't be the same. Yeah, this is very close to done, I think. We can probably even leave the feet, even though they're a mess right now. Just finish up with the rest. I didn't intend to noodle so long today. Happens sometimes. Because I, I, there's still plenty to noodle on the face. What I'm trying to do at this stage is catch everything else up. Oh yeah, Dai Tsutsumi and Robert Kondo. Yeah, they're amazing. I love their work. I, I haven't had them as teachers, but I, I have to remedy that. I need to take some classes with those fellows. Mm -hmm. Put this on top of everything as an opaque. Uh, no, I don't think I've met Nathan Fox. I may have, but I don't think so. Um, I just have, he was teaching when I was there and I remember seeing the work that came out of Art Center at that time. I was like, damn. There's a lot of a lot of students, uh, a lot of my peers that that I admire their work, and they were students of his. I think he's he'd be a great teacher.
What will my mentorship involve? I don't know yet. It's, uh, the, the problem is just over-promising uh, at this stage. Like I have ideas on how I'd like it to go, but it's, it's gonna be so dependent on work and what time I'm able to actually spare for, for these things that are gonna decide that. So, oh, that's weird. That's uh, what it's coming down to. Shit. Ah, yeah, that is not what I wanted to do at all. Or not till next month. Can can I just make you much better? <laughs> well, we can always continue working together, Irina. There's not a problem there. Um, and and I want to make it. I want to be as accessible as I can be. But work is is just intense, and it's gonna get more intense because. Um, well, I just agreed to a new job, and it's gonna be a more um, demanding one. So that's, that's kind of the place I'm at right now. I'll tell you guys more about it as things develop. Um, but it's, it's a huge enough deal that it was enough to make me, um, reconsider my previous AD job. So I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm crunching, trying to get my current job up to speed so that they can operate without me because this new one is going to be intensive. My goal is to do the new job, learn everything I can from this amazing team on that job, and keep the Twitch going for sure, if that's, if that's feasible. And then the Patreon is after that. So what we can do is, I, I think that the, yeah, at, the, at this stage, I'm not even sure if I can do for sure even the, the previous tier, the, the tier underneath mentorship just yet. It's gonna, I'm going to have to wait and see until this new job starts out. Um, so, yeah, if, in all honesty, if you're, if you're still supporting and hoping that um, we're going to get started in February, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I can do that either. So if you're feeling more comfortable with pulling out, I'd totally recommend it. I know I'm killing you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it, it, it's for really good reason. And, and I can't wait to tell you about it, but it's a really good reason. Yeah, I'm sorry, Arena. I'm sorry for everybody. I feel so bad. I fucking, I had this plan and it just hasn't played out that way. Um, but let's, let's talk, you know, message me, uh, privately on, on the discord and we'll see if we can figure something out. Yeah. Truly at this stage, I think it's just going to be bolstering your confidence because your work is great. You're getting, you're basically getting to that infuriating phase where like it, it was the same for me. I remember, I think I told you guys this story that when I was working at Sony uh, for this IP we were developing that ne it never really took off. Uh, we brought in Ian McKegg and I basically just followed him around like a lost puppy for the entire time he was on the contract. And I was trying to get his, I was really just wanting his like opinion on my portfolio, like what could, what I could do better. And he was just like, man, you're so good. This is great. That's awesome. Like, just keep it up. And it was like, no, no, it's not good enough. I need, I need, uh, I need that validation. 
you are you are amazing. Tell me that I am that. Tell me how I can be like you. And really, all it, he was telling me the truth that my work was plenty good enough. I just needed to be more confident in it. He was a little bit more elusive than me, but <laughs> that guy is a total sweetheart. If you ever get a chance to take classes with him or uh, even just go to one of his workshops, God, he's just so, he's one of those people that's just a presence. He's just so exciting and everybody loves him. He is adored. He is one of those people that every now and then you meet someone that that has kind of a natural, genuine excitement that they can that that they exude, and it's really impressive to watch him. I mean, as a as a teacher, I love watching him teach. Uh, I love learning from him, but even more than that, his presence and how he can get you excited is incredible. It's it's incredible to watch. He's a really really amazing man. And he's got some cool stories. I think that's one of the things I learned from him watching him is that storytelling is a big part of teaching. Irina, it's not an issue of, of uh, like you not being able, not having an idea of repeating it. You already have the skill set to make that happen. So at this stage, your only job is to continue challenging yourself to make stuff that you can feel good about that's it i mean there isn't a at leveling up at this stage once once you attain sort of a point where you're able to get the work that you want you're able to get the recognition for your work then it's just about competing with yourself and it's i know that's easier said than done but it's just there there's no really there's no manual for you know beyond intermediate really then what you do it's interesting it's kind of like the the myth of the the black belt right i've told you guys that story before where like it's it's believed that in karate they would like have you they would you would buy your gi and you would get a gi with a nice white belt and then over the years the belt would get dirty and you would never wash it it would get dirty 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 and then after a long enough time of rolling around on the ground and getting your ass kicked and getting blood in it it would turn black and then you were a black belt right and then over time that that belt that was black would slowly fall apart and fray and become white again. It's kind of like that. It's a great metaphor for what we do. So there's a point and you're probably nearing it right now where your understanding is and your understanding and your and your ability are a higher level and you're feeling like there should be more complex things ahead. But really what needs to happen now is to stop and go back and start all over in a sense reacquaint yourself with all of the basics and this is something that i have to teach myself regularly i have to remind myself that it's about reacquainting myself with the basics because there's it's like reading a book you know a thousand times you're gonna pick up details that you didn't notice before and learning is exactly the same way if you're learning something you're so busy in the very beginning just trying to understand the mechanics of it like oh i hold the brush like this oh what I have to press this button and do that. And then over time, you, you grow familiar with these elements. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, this is, this is easy. What's next? Really, you have missed a lifetime of stuff in the first lessons. And just keep going back and go back and go back and go through it. It's like, um, it's like panning for gold, right? You're going to get the big chunks initially, but then there's still value in that stuff. You just need to go back through it and never assume that you know everything. Because the, the moment you assume that you know everything as a living as a, a living artist forever student, you're, it's over, you've lost. You, you don't know everything, I don't know everything. Uh, Ian doesn't know everything. We're all constantly learning. And it's, it's a good idea to just lean into that. Lean into it and continue your learning. Go back. Never be too, never be too good that you can't um, study some more. Study the basics. And sometimes it just takes being reminded of that. What company am, am I at now? I am currently working for a small studio in Romania called Amber. Uh, we are building 
a new HD game studio within the grander studio. That's that's the the job that I'm giving up right now. So we're building a brand new IP. I've written the IP and uh, I've been doing concept art, building up a style guide, excuse me, a Bible, all that good stuff. That's what I've been doing for the last three or four months with this first gig. The new one is going to be easier and harder all at the same time. It's going to be interesting. Can't wait to tell you guys about it because it's pretty big for me. <laughs> caveat, caveat. Isn't Ian mostly about drawing? I'm assuming you're talking about Ian. Uh, he can paint just fine, um, but he thinks in line. Like he not thinks. That's not the right word. His his quick ideation system is with a pencil, and it's it's incredible to watch because it's it's so it's so very much an old school system that it's it's like it's pretty interesting. Like he, he, he'll, he'll sit down with pencil and then he draws and draws and then he comes up with like a cool scribble or something and then he'll put down another piece of paper on top of it and then he'll work from that as, not as a tracing, but as like an under layer and then he'll do something else and then he'll just tape paper together if it's, if he needs to go bigger. It's just this immediacy that's really cool. I dig it. Don't be worried about pencils and lines. You should pick them up yourself. That's another way. Actually, that's another, uh, that reminds me, that's a good way to help yourself level up is to start adopting other mediums that force you to think about problem solving, how you've been problem solving, but in a different way. So if you struggle with pencil, maybe now's the time to try out something. Um, a perfect example of this was for me, uh, I came from pencil and then I wanted to get into painting when I was at Art Center and, and illustration. And then I took a class with uh, Norm Sherman that was uh, dynamic sketching, which Peter Hahn does now. Peter Hahn took over uh, for Norm after he died. Um, and that class forced me to change everything about what I understood about drawing because instead of pencil, I was doing it with a pen and just by changing the changing my medium and forcing me to examine and kind of re rebuild over bad habits it changed how i drew and it changed how i painted 100 percent, 100 percent. that was a major contributor to my improvement as a painter so i think that's a, a really good uh, approach Pick up that pencil, get on it. Loomis and hand sketching now. Good, good. Do you have a sketchbook? That's another thing I can't recommend enough is have sketchbooks, fill up sketchbooks with whatever medium you like. doesn't really matter. Just fill sketchbooks. What I love about sketchbooks, and I think this is probably universal for a lot of people that have kept them in the past, is that years later you go back through those sketchbooks and you're like, this is genius. Who drew this? <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Did I get Peter's dynamic Bible? Uh, no, I uh, because Pete and I are friends, um, I have a, a digital copy of it that I will not be distributing. But I asked him specifically for that because of um, because I was on the boat and I didn't have space for books. So it was a special case. Definitely, uh, if you want to get Pete's books, and I know he's doing it, or I think he's just finished it, his new dynamic Bible. Um, support the guy for sure. He's doing great things. I'm really, really proud of him. 
Pete is a, a really good teacher. He's another teacher that I really enjoy watching for teaching specifically. Because he also is quite good at, at, at delivering that energy and getting people really excited about stuff. I always admire that when a speaker can do that. You took Taekwondo with him more than a decade ago. Oh, that's awesome. Are you up in Portland too? That's crazy. So you knew him when I was getting to know him. Irina, thanks for hanging out. That was real fun. Um, yeah, hit me up on Discord and we'll we'll talk and see if we can figure something out that will help you. Um, Sweet in Oregon, badass. You're enjoying the chilly air as, as I am. But yeah, we'll chat, Arena. Okay. Let's just do real quick. Let's merge these down. Saving. Take it easy, young lady. I have no idea how old you are, but it's fun to say it. I'm old now. I get to say stuff like that. Like, cutely sexist. <laughs> That's not true. You can never technically say that stuff. Oh, you were at Leica. Nice. I was very keen in getting in there when I first came back. Um, but production... Uh, so production halted for you guys too. I, I have friends at some of the other studios uh, here in town and like there was COVID and then the fires and all that shit. I imagine it was the same for you guys at Leica, eh? Hmm. <laughs> ah, hate it when it does that. They did a layoff too. God, that sucks. What's Leica's current show? They're not doing the Key and Peel one, right? Okay, we gotta clean this up. Oops. Ah, oh, damn it. There we go. Yeah, I've been wanting to do a studio tour at Leica for a long time. The last time I was to do anything with that studio was uh, when it was still Will Vinton. It was the last time I was down there. I had a friend that was interning there when I was in just out of high school, I think. So I got to see the California raisins. That was about it. <laughs> oh, you did the first three features. So Coraline and uh, Paranorman, right? That's awesome. I'm super jelly. Those look like really fun projects. Oh, at, uh, oh, I see, when it was still Will Vinton, okay. 
Are you an animation or are you doing a concept? That was my issue when I was poking around out there is that they didn't like, it sounded like they outsourced the concept art and then it's all really about the animation there, which is cool, but not much space for Izzy. Yeah. He's missed. So I'm just trying to get the, the hands basically finished enough looking. I'm gonna bathe all of this in, in a glow. So I'm not too fussed. I'm gonna try not to be too fussed about it. Adriano Do Quoto, Couto, thank you so much for that follow. Appreciate that. You're a map painter and illustrator. Nice. That's awesome. Are you on the Discord? Got to join up and share your work. Awesome, thanks. Saved. We need some atmosphere here. We are faking atmosphere at this point. It's just an artistic addition, but it's because I really don't like how much the finger was kind of melting into the background there. I'm gonna have to hit the lights, the lights on the fingers more strongly. Just up that contrast more so it pops out in front. Yeah. Well, now it's like the same as the sky. God damn it. <laughs> All right, let's see what that looks like. Nope, it's, this is a lose-lose for me, gang. All right, so what we're gonna have to do is go in between. I'm not painting all the way to the edge and painting in the in the center, the sort of the core, putting the light there just so that there's a little bit of darkness on the far side so that there is contrast with the background. So there's a, there's always a different way of doing things. And we got to speed up. Okay, let me do the glow on this thing. I'll add the lighting from that glow. We might have to remove the crown for time, although I really like it. That will we'll leave the crown because it's pretty cool. Okay. Actually, I can, yeah, we'll do it on the previous layer.
Donkers need some help. He recently noticed he can't come up with anything to draw and end up just drawing a bunch of circles. Hmm. That is an interesting problem. Well, that's a... Uh, from the perspective of a commercial artist. So a commercial artist kind of has to do, has to imbue the work that they're working on with emotional sauce, if you will. And hold on, let me fast forward this. It's a very distracting sound. There we go. So for us, we're basically paid to dump emotion into things that aren't necessarily giving that to us to begin with. We're, we're art whores. That's what we do. So one of the ways that you can do that you can deal with this is to try to find a way to abstract the emotion that you've been drawing from in order to get your drawings out and try to abstract that emotion into a specific problem. So give yourself a challenge and then paint or draw using your using the sort of emotional impetus that, that, that you can draw from. That's one way of doing it. The other way is to try to go the opposite route and try to not make your drawings about emotion. Try to uh, make artwork. It's an interesting challenge because You'll, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about once you start. But if you stop trying to imbue your work with emotion and you actively make an effort to make your drawings and solve problems without any emotion whatsoever, you will find that you dump it in there anyway. And that's the other way. So you're kind of tricking your brain, tricking your heart into giving you the juice, the sauce. So there's a couple of options there for you to try. Believe me, I've done, I mean, magic's a perfect example. Um, I've painted a lot of things and drawn a lot of things where I was not inspired and I did not have that emotional connection to whatever it was I was doing. But because it was a job, I had to get it done. And that changes how you approach it a little bit. It makes it less precious in regard to, you know, getting that catharsis, uh, cathartic feeling out it's not about the catharsis the catharsis is a byproduct instead of the product so if you change the product make it about the piece rather than about the catharsis then it will free up that it you're because at the moment it sounds like it's kind of an emotional constipation as a result of feeling like the only way that you can make your artwork is through this catharsis that that you need that it's the same mistake that a lot of artists and writers have made in the past where they're like, I need, the only way I can create is if I'm drunk or the only way I can create is if I am going through massive emotional turmoil. So they create problems for themselves, like, uh, you know, with lovers or drama, like they need the drama in order to be creative. And that's not true at all. Create, being creative is just a, it is a process of problem solving that everybody's brain has. Everyone is creative. Um, that's basically just what your brain does. It's a problem solving machine, regardless of whether or not you use it to make art, it's problem solving and it's creative. So understanding that the machine just needs the elements for the work, which is a problem and the drive for a solution. That's all you need. You don't need to feed off of emotion. You don't need to, uh, have drama. You don't need to be drunk or high or whatever to create. Now, it can certainly be fun to use that as fuel now and then, but like all things, a little bit of uh, moderation goes a long way. I mean, you only get the one life, right? So have a little bit of fun, be melodramatic, get into the juicy parts of life you know, have lover spats, um, make mistakes, all that good stuff. 
but never think that your art is defined by that that one thing because it's not all it is is problem solving and just take it back to that constantly remind yourself that this is not as precious as i think it is and that what what creativity really is what what life really is in regard to problem solving in regard to your interaction with everyone and everything around you is a form of play that you're playing. We're all playing with each other right now. When you get off and you get pissed off at somebody because they cut you off in traffic, it's just play. Might as well enjoy it. Even when it's miserable, you can find joy in that. And that that sounds counterintuitive, but truly, it's like, uh, have you ever been really, really sick or you've been infirm for a little while, like a broken leg or something like that? And when you're in it, you're like, God, I wish that I appreciated the times when I was healthy. God, I wish, you know, it's so hard to breathe right now, case in point, you know, with current events. Or, you know, I can't move my, I can't itch my leg. I wish I'd enjoyed that when I had it. If you can get into that mindset about everything, Everything becomes play. Everything is delightful. Even the miserable shit, even heartbreak, loss, everything can be enjoyed because there is nothing else. So you better fucking enjoy it. Sure, I'll I'll, dr I'll drunk sketch your your proof, Thunderwunk. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, David's right on that one. It's the it ties back to the problem solving concept that if if we understand first that our brains are problem solving machines, then as machines that do that they're going to be more effective when they have more things to build from. When you've got more Lego kit in your brain, visual vocabulary, hobbies, chase down everything that's of interest to you, everything, anything, even if it's a whim, like, oh, I'm curious, how does a carburetor work? Learn, figure it out. Get on. I love YouTube. I love YouTube so much because it's so great for following that kind of thinking. But as a designer, as, a, as an artist, that stuff will always be useful. It may not be useful right now, but when you think about the core of what creativity really is, it is taking two extant things that everybody knows and putting them together, and then you've made something new. There is no such thing as creativity that's outside of that. It is always taking two ideas, two concepts, two totally unrelated things, whatever, and putting them together. That's creativity in a nutshell. And if you feed your brain with tons of information, tons of vocabulary, then you put that, when you're not actively trying to solve something, you let your brain just kind of go wild with the information it has. You have more options for a creative solution. The less learned you are in different things, the less options you have. So David's totally right about me being right. <laughs> if I don't mind tooting my own horn. <laughs> Saved again. 100% when you're not trying to think of a solution, that's when your brain thinks of it. This is called the passive mode network. I talked about it a little bit with that, uh, I think it was with um, uh, CMAC. I did that podcast with CMAC, uh, what was it, like three weeks ago? No, not even three weeks, two weeks ago, something like that. Uh, if you go onto my, uh, onto my YouTube, there's a playlist called uh, Featuring Izzy or something like that. And I think I have it linked in there. So you can see my, inter my interview, my podcast discussion with uh, CMAC. And we talk a little bit about the Passive Mode Network. <laughs> it needs that gob of gold. Women are of interest to you, so you will chase them down. Best of luck, my friend. 
You will enjoy prison. <laughs> Kilrathi, greetings. Welcome. That's good. It, it should all click because it's all, in some senses, invariable truths. Turning your brain off is the deepest struggle that I think almost everybody can relate to. Um, don't feel bad about it. It is what it is. Even the most uh, enlightened person still has brain rot now and, now and again. From my own study and from my own experience, the best way to get control over your brain to turn it off is to be 100% present. And that's easier said than done. It, does, it definitely requires practice, but presence, and I don't mean presence of mind, I mean presence of being, is the most surefire way to make sure that your brain isn't chattering at you because your brain is so busy experiencing where you are right now, experiencing everything around you, the smells, the tastes, all that good stuff. That, that is presence. That is the only way you'll ever be free of your brain chittering. Because like I said, what you have in there, the, the whole creative process is a problem solving machine. So this problem solving machine, if it's not actively working on something or you're not, you're not aware of how to use awareness to silence it, it's going to be chittering away and working. It's calculating. It's always working on problems. And if you don't have an active problem right now, it'll make one for you. So it'll, and this is the problem with it is if you have, if your brain is coming up with a problem, so it'll think, okay, here's this horrible thing I said once, or this is an embarrassing thing that will happen to me. The past and the future, your brain gets caught in a cycle thinking about that. And what's destructive about it is it makes you feel something. So something that's not real at all that your brain has invented or brought back up, it's no longer present, it's not now, is causing you emotional damage. And that's where it's really dangerous. So learning, so I think just being able to kind of manage presence of mind is one of the best ways that you can help with self-care too, because that's the most damaging thing to you. I mean, other people, it's that whole sticks and stones thing, right? Sticks and stones can hurt you, really. They can, but you heal from that. Something that you can't heal from the same way is this constant neurotic mental torture that you're constantly giving to yourself. So mindfulness and presence is honestly, it's the only way out of it that I've ever discovered. And it's so much easier than you think it is. Like everybody thinks like you need to be sitting on a mat with a shaved head in a monastery where with total silence and you don't speak for weeks. I don't think that's true at all. I'm not religious, but I do see the practical use of mindfulness. And all it requires you do is that when you're doing something, whatever it may be, you wholly give yourself to that thing. That's it. It's that easy. So if you're cutting wood, you're thinking about how carefully you make your movement to cut the wood. You're thinking about your stance. You're thinking about how you're holding your weight, your posture. You're thinking about how the air smells. You're experiencing what is happening right now and not forming an opinion on it. Just being there. Just be there. That's it. You don't need to do any other meditative practice. That's all meditation really trains you to do is how to be there. And if you can do that, you will be shocked to discover that while you're there, you weren't thinking about anything. And also, the thing that I love the most about it is that when you are there, that's also when your best ideas come. When you're not trying to solve a problem. Your brain is so good at this thing. It has all the tools it needs. All you have to do is, is sit back and let it, let it do its thing. But make sure that it's focused on something specific, not that it's... Make sure that it's focused on a problem rather than a letting it kind of find something that has an emotional fuel for you that makes you feel bad or good even. Like make-believe is this kind of the same thing, not make-believe, but daydreaming is kind of the same thing, but in a more positive light. An advice question. 
where my cursor was, it looked like he had a nipple piercing right there. <laughs> Meditation practices. Meditation practices can help, but I think that they're ultimately going to just get you to the point where you understand that you can meditate without meditating. Advice question for me. How do I deal with being exhausted at the end of the workday at 7 p.m.? Some days you don't even want to eat dinner and just want to go to bed. So you're energized for the next day. Honestly, any job feels like that, David. So it's going to be that way. There's, there's not really a way about around getting becoming fully exhausted other than managing how you're getting exhausted. So this is where my like hard out, you know, socialist communism comes into play. The concept of, you know, the 10 or 12 hour workday, especially for entertainment industry, because that's how it is for us, is insane. Um, that's just not how humans are made. We're made, if you look at, if you look at any other creature that we're even similar, similar to, there's a load of like chilling that happens. And we, especially in Western society, prize work above all else. Work is validation. The moment you can no longer provide work, you're no longer valuable. That's, it's that simple. That's why we treat elderly the way we do. That's why we treat children the way we do. That's why we have the, the problems that we do with uh, uh, healthcare is our country has turned productivity in in terms of of the job and workplace into the definition of a valuable life or a life well lived so that's that's it doesn't sound like it but that's actually the solution here Koba, hey the solution is changing how you work so that you're not killing yourself at work so you're so exhausted there's a different there's different kinds of exhausted and it's the way I like to think about it is there's the exhaustion that comes from like just playing all day. Like you've been out, you've been on a great walk, you're with friends, you're tired. But when you're tired, it's a good feeling. And then there's the tired that happens when you've given your essence to the machine. And the machine has thanklessly ground you out for that day and you're done. You're just done. And it feels horrible. You don't go to bed with a smile on your face. You go to bed just lamenting that you have to do it again the next day so you have to change how you work you have to change what you define for yourself as a good work day change your tasks change how you manage your tasks this is none of this is to say that you necessarily need to to like do work badly you just need to manage how you're working so that you're working a little bit less focused you're allowing yourself time for breaks you're allowing your brain to take in other things. If you're just sitting at the desk all day, and I'm super guilty of this, I do this too. So grain of salt me on this. But if you're at the desk all day and it's not giving you any kind of joy at the end of day, at the end of the day, then you need to find other ways to fill your day so that there's other things going on in your brain. You need you need a break. The way we the way we have set up work is totally broken. The way we've set up life is totally broken here. It's not natural. It's not right. And until we do things, I mean, we need we need to do major changes because the quality of life that we have being dictated is rather the value of a life being dictated by being product productive is it's sick. It's actually really sick. Um, I mean, a perfect example, like I said, is thinking about kids and, and the elderly, like other cultures see the value in them and cherish them in different ways because there's more to contributing to life. There's more to contributing to the betterment of society than being productive. There's the storytellers, there's the makers, there's the, there's the, the, the people that, I mean, there's, what about how we deal with our, our mental illness? Like that used to be a thing of value. Like they, these were people that saw the world in a different way. So we cherish them. We don't do that here. So you have to do that for yourself. You have to manage for yourself how you're going to go through your day until we catch up. Because right now, when it comes, we may be first in the world in a lot of things. But in terms of happiness and, and a life well lived, I think the U.S. is probably dead bottom. I mean, for a, a first world country in which you don't have to worry about the barest needs of survival. 
that I mean, it's crazy that we that we put up with this. Not only that we put up with this, but that we inculcate it into our children, and and it happens, you know, year after year. We just keep destroying minds. It's terrible. Sorry, I got a little got a little ranty there. I didn't paint at all. Let's see. It's like wearing. Kilrathi, you count for meditation. That's good. Oh, yeah, the old memory thing is the worst. The embarrassing moment. Worrying is a massive misuse of the imagination. And unfortunately, it's something that we all do compulsively. It's so common. This madness is so common that we think it's normal that that kind of neuroses is normal. And it's really not. I don't think it's our, our natural way of being. And we're never taught. I wish we were taught like mindfulness and the things that I've learned since. I wish I was taught that in elementary school. I'd be a completely different person right now. Um, I would not have had like the severe social anxieties and all the horrible things that I had when I was younger. I mean, I still have them, but I would, I would be able to have the tools to manage them so much better. And I wouldn't have wasted years just like lost in, in obsessing about the past or the future. And it's sad that so many people don't even know that there's another option. No worries, donkers. I'm just glad you're hanging out with us. A fellow socialist communist, yes. You're trying to figure out how to stay energized in the evening so you can make time for personal work as well as having time to learn new things. It's honestly, it's going to be about deciding. It's going to be about deciding how much of yourself you put into your work. I've heard lots of different theories, you know, like the 80 20 method and things like that. Um, really, it just comes down to this for me. Um, no matter what company you're working for, it's a company. And if you ever became difficult, if you were ever non-productive to the level that they want, they would not care a dicky damn about getting rid of you. You don't owe anything to a corporation. You don't owe anything to a company. Do your work. Do what you need to do. But by no means, kill yourself to get it done. Um, you can, if, if something, and this is actually one of the great things about working in a big group like a studio, is that you can allow yourself to work on something, set it down, and then go home for the day and just let all of that go. And then you come back the next day, you pick it up and continue. If anything, that's that's the difference I found between working in a studio and working freelance. Freelance, it's there because you're the only person. So it's always there. Even when you're done for the day and you go and do something else, there's this nagging thing always in your head that says, oh God, I got to do that thing. I, ha I also have to do this other thing. That's the other, that's the other problem with freelances. You, you're not just, if you're a freelance concept artist, you're not just doing concept art. You're doing concept art. You're doing marketing. You're doing management. You're doing agency work. You're doing a dozen different jobs all by yourself. And it's exhausting. So that's the downside. Yeah, you get paid more, but God damn, does it take it out of you? So that's what I learned when I was out on the boat and when I was freelancing is like, I don't need to take all these jobs. I don't. What, what I need is enough to get by enough to do the things that I need to do to pay my bills. And then beyond that, it's my time and I'm going to use it how I want to use it. I'm going to live this life. This is the only one I got. So you have to readjust your expectations for yourself. Again, this comes back to the mentality that we are raised in. We're inculcated in this mentality. Those of us from the West, not everybody is from out here, but we're inculcated in this mentality that we need to constantly be productive and that you are not a good person if you're not productive. You are not going to be wealthy if you're not productive. If you're not wealthy, you're not a good person. It's like it all, it's this horrible cycle of self-judgment that the system has built and it's perfect. It's perfect. And it's designed to grind your soul away. And so you will die completely unfulfilled, not ever having done the things that you really cared about that really had meaning for you because they managed to get that, that time out of you. So if you remember that, and I know it sounds terribly negative, but if you remember to think of it, that it's almost that antagonistic, that this system is designed to grind you up, you won't feel so bad about being like, eh, I'll save it for tomorrow. It's not a big deal. I'll go home, I'll relax make some nice dinner and work on my own thing. That's the only way, that's the only way. Cause they're not gonna give you time. 
They're always going to want more. Always. You can say uh, you comfortably, comfortably waste vast amounts of time doing nothing. You're now used to that now. <laughs> Work to be able to do nothing. It's the greatest thing to do. Exactly. My, my perspective is I want to live in perpetual summer vacation if I can. That feeling of what it was like when I was a kid, um, you know, with nothing, nothing specific to do. You can just sit and lay in the sun if you want to. Go talk to who you want to talk to. Go do what you want to do. It's the best feeling. But of course, we're adults. We know that we can't do that. We have to do something to get to make money. But what you should do, I think, this is, again, grain of salt. This is my perspective. I'm not telling you you have to do this, but I'm saying you, the ubiquitous. Like, what I think people should do is worry about that time because that's the stuff that you're going to remember. It's going to be those adventures and, and the fun things you do. You're not going to be thinking about what, like, oh, I got that job done in the cubicle when you're on your deathbed. It's not going to matter. And this is this is the next level to that that I really realized. And this is part of like what happened with me um, leaving studio work was once the game is done and it's out and then the reviews came in and all of that shit, another game comes. It didn't need to take your whole life for that time. You made a product. Great. It's beautiful, wonderful, cool. But at the same time, it's finite and it's not worth killing yourself over. That's what I learned. And it's such a valuable lesson and they don't really teach you that. They are constantly telling you. And when I say they, I mean the system, man. Buck the system, right? They're constantly telling you that you need to sacrifice your time, your energy, your life, your love, everything for the product. Make that product, make that product, make that product constantly. And it's going to kill you. So if you want to have, if you want to have any semblance of a comfortable life where you get to explore the things that you want to, that you want to explore and, and grow the things that you want to grow, nurture what you want to nurture, you have to prioritize work lower and let that and be okay with that. Even though everything we're taught about, everything in your gut says work is the most important thing. Productivity is the most important thing. Understand that that is brainwashing just like any other cult. That's all it is. It's just you've been brainwashed to believe that. And it's going to, there is a physical reaction to it too. I mean, I think that's true with actual brainwashing, right? Is like you've been programmed a certain way. And then when you break your programming, it's uncomfortable. And it was for me too, for a long time, especially living on a boat. I was like, God damn, I should be doing something. I have all this time. What am I doing? And I had to learn to relax, to learn to slow down and let go. And it's, it was one of the greatest lessons I think I could have gotten. At, th at that time, it was the perfect thing for me to learn. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. I should subscribe to Howie Hawkins' YouTube channel. I, d I don't know him. I'll have to check it out. Barris needs to start survival. All those homeless tents in Los Angeles under bridges and Gavin Newsom's tenure calls that into question. That's a fair point. Um, and again, this is, I think... The, the reason I'm emphasizing that it is not you, it's the system. Because the whole system operates this way. That's how you end up with people living in tent cities. Because we valued what they could contribute in terms of productivity rather than what they contri could contribute in improving anybody else's life. The only thing of value is the money. It sucks, but it's, that's the society that we live in. So you have to operate within it to some degree. I acknowledge that and I do it too. But you can't say that there, there, there is no validity to the argument that because we live in this society, we can't, in, in this society as it is, we can't dream of something better and argue for something better because that's how you change things. You, gotta, you have to inform people up to a certain tipping point so that they can understand for themselves and that, so that they're convinced also that this system doesn't work and if you get enough people to that tipping point that's when change happens that's how you end up with like you know a civil rights vote and stuff like that w women's vote it's because somebody pushed and everybody else was like hey yeah actually it's crazy that kids are working in mines maybe we shouldn't do that right so it's this it's a slow evolution just keep talking about it keep sharing your experience and people over time will 
start to see if if there's legitimacy legitimacy to your argument and you're able to continually make that argument then it's worth it because people will begin to see the light it may and it may never happen in my lifetime that you know we have a ubi or that we have a way for everybody to contribute to society but in, in a different system rather than monetarily that may not happen in my lifetime but hopefully i've influenced somebody at some point that maybe tipped us over the edge i missed quite a few comments here with my ranting potato cavallo thank you so much for that follow i'm really sorry i missed that welcome New York's public school system does try to reinforce a lot of social values from a young age. That's great. And yeah, you're right. They're not reinforced the moment that you're let out. None of that's reinforced. It's that's one of the terrible things because there is this institutionalization that happens and con seems to continue um, cradle to the grave, right? Learning mindfulness as a child, is, what, would, what a different world would that be? Oh my God, for real. I know that some schools have experimented with teaching mindfulness and in, in conflict, conflict resolution stuff, but um, it's not it, basically what David is saying that, it, you know, you need to be able to see, you need to be able to see these systems working throughout the society for it to really work. I agree 100%. Um, so we need to find ways to support that kind of thinking as you grow up because you're going to encounter stuff that's because the society is already broken. You're going to constantly bump into this shit and it's tough. You learn to let's not and say we did in the school systems, English literature. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. I have, I have other friends from different districts and it's very much the same. Like there's this, they have commodified education into a system that supports and builds workers and, you know, manufacturers, but happy people. Mm -mm. We need we need a big shift for that. This is needed advice for the art student coming out of art school. Yeah, I think it's for everybody. Uh, Donnie Flo, I am uh, I'll be 41 in a couple of a couple of months. We live in a society, yeah. Memento Mori, remember that you will die. Yep, that's exactly my point. Uh, 100%, you're going to die. You really, really have to become comfortable with that notion. you got to sit and really think about it. Because when you do, only then are your goals and your assessment for yourself and your future really clear when you are completely aware that there is a very limited amount of time for me to do this. Howie Hawkins is the creator of the Green New Deal and co-creator of Medicare for All. Oh, okay. Co-founder of the Green Party, I see. Okay, I, I knew I'd heard the name, but I, I did not know he had a, a show. I didn't know that that was who that was either. We'll be honest. Again, I'm terrible with names. Oh, that's how I recognize the name. He's a presidential candidate for the Green Party. Gotcha. Cool. Draval, thank you so much for that follow. Fodi, Mad Fodi Madre Jones? Johns? <laughs> Fodi, thank you so much for that follow also. Yeah, thanks for those notes, David. We'll check that guy out for sure. Well, he's my guy in that, in that he's a proponent for it, for sure. I'm I'm very much with the uh, the younger crowds that I mean, obviously they know who he is. I I don't, but uh, the the younger crowds that are pushing for it more actively. Um, I don't think a Green Party is going to do it until you actually change the the voting system. It's just not going to happen. Everything about what we've built is going to guarantee a two-party system. So even if the Green Party rises, the Republicans would fall and the Democrats would become the new Republicans. It's, that's how it's going to work out. Our system is unfortunately um, flawed in this respect. I have been ranting for like 40 minutes, so i got to finish this damn painting. This is going to be the longest session ever. 
go ahead and get right on that crown. I don't like that, how that turned it green. Yeah, it's good stuff. Agreed, Donnie. Yeah, I think local elections is going to be the way to start it if you're able to. I mean, acknowledging firstly that there is only going to be two parties. But yeah, local elections is key. That's definitely something I learned in this last administration. Actually, I learned it quite a bit with the, t I didn't realize it at the time, but the Tea Party was very effective at this. They basically infiltrated the system and gamed it very well. We're definitely gonna have to do some accent darks because these are not dark enough. We will add those after we finish the crown, though. Yeah, there is a Green Party donkers. They've just been r remarkably bad at, uh, at selling themselves, unfortunately. Because they have a lot of good points. It's such a marketing thing, unfortunately. Like, I mean... I, I wasn't really into, what's her name, Marianne Williamson, the, the woo-woo. She was very woo-woo um, candidate this last, for the Democrats. And I completely blew her off when I first started seeing her talk. Cause she was talking about, you know, auras and shit. And it was very, it was for a person like me, a pretty hard pragmatist. It was like, what is this? What is the practical use of any of this? And then after she, fell out of the running and I actually started to see her speaking a little bit more carefully. She has tons of good points. She would have been a great president, but it is what it is. So much of this is like a, it's a popularity game. Biden was 100% my last choice though. I really didn't even think he had a chance. He's so milk toast. The Greens have been successful in influencing the Democrats to the left. Uh, to a degree, yeah, I'd, I'd argue that's true. For the moment though, Overton window wise, we're still an ultra right wing country. I mean, there's nothing radical really about the stuff that Bernie and uh, even Hawkins were, are talking about. That's not radical at all. It's not radical leftism. We're just taking shortcuts for rendering out this uh, glass crown. It's about the same brightness. Uh, 
I can, well, I don't know. I'd say I'm a pretty radical leftist. I'm not pro-violence. But I agree. That's that's a better way. That's a better way to use that verbiage. So y you're right, Donkers. I agree with you. Do you ever use a bit of photo bashing to speed up some of the painting process? I do. I have a couple of lessons on how to photo bash better for a painter so that it looks more like a painting. Um, I do use it, but it requires me to go online and search for it. And I don't, I don't bother with that when I'm, when I'm streaming because God knows what would pop up. <laughs> also, I have a lot of, uh, search stuff that has to do with work. That is secrety. Let's go ahead and throw in a little bit of subsurface scattering. Um, I use photo bashing almost always, almost exclusively for noise, um, to create shapes and things that I wouldn't have, that I don't naturally come up with. That's about it. I really don't use it for, um, much beyond that. It certainly has its place. Kova! Yeah, I'll give it a look, David. Gully Chan, thank you so much for that follow. Is the concept of modesty a thing without the concept of shaming? Is the concept of modesty a thing? Hmm, it's an interesting question. I certainly think that the two can exist without each other. I don't think that they're that they define each other necessarily.
I gotta think about that. It's a good question. I guess the question is, do we think, is modesty the opposite of shame? Instinctually, I want to say no, but I'm trying to formulate as to why I think no. We need to knock this back just a touch here so I can add it. Whoops. Saving. Yeah, that's the right choice. You don't have much time today? Oh, thank you so much, Kylie Chan, for hanging out. I appreciate you stopping in. Um, if you're interested, we have Mondays and Wednesdays we're on at 3 p.m. and Saturdays we're on in the afternoon like today. Uh, that schedule has been held for, I think, a couple months now, so come join us anytime. You're riding the struggle bus with the illustration you're working on right now. <laughs> I know that bus well. I have a permanent pass. Hmm. I guess in kind of, the way I'm thinking about it right now, I guess in, a, in kind of the biblical sense, you could argue that immodesty is a source of shame. Like, isn't that, that's even a line, right? They, they, they realized they were naked and then were suddenly filled with shame and it took the realization first. But I don't know. I think you could probably still have one without the other. Like you can have modesty without shame being a part of it, a natural modesty. And I think sometimes things can just feel shameful even when they're not. That's like how people can, you know, think that the word moist is naughty, right? It's this, it's a projection, yeah? Yeah, costuming characters is rough. I completely get that. Okay, I guess we can do a final pass here. Let's go ahead and close all of these. Saved. Let's take a look at our values. I think it's clearly glowing. food for thought. Yeah. I mean, that's one I don't really have. I don't have an answer for. I do think that you can be modest without shaming. In fact, I think modesty is probably the, a natural state of being. I think shame probably comes from more from the expectation of something. This is a perfect example. Um, when I was a kid, we were frequently homeless and, uh, you know, we lived a hard, a pretty hard life. I mean, it's certainly not harder than the vast majority of people that, that exist out there, but it, you know, it had its, its downs. But when I was a kid, I didn't realize that. 
And it wasn't about modesty. It was just complete ignorance that the world saw that as bad. When I went to school and it was framed within the experience of other people, and I was actually able to compare other people's uh, existences, then I started to see the lack in my own and felt shame for it. That, that's where I'm kind of getting stuck is because to me, shame has many sources and it's not just an issue of forced modesty. Do you know what I'm saying? I think shame can be, obviously, just with my last description, I consider shame to be troublesome. It's not necessarily a useful thing. But at the same time, when we're talking about people living shamelessly in a society in which shame is a behavior modifier, the administration, case in point, and, the peop- and basically just politicians in general, You have a problem. Uh, They have no shame and there's nothing that's going to make them see that they should feel shame. And that's become worse over time. And I think that is also a construct of um, media and and societal norms. So where do I kind of uh, give it its origination? Reality TV. When we made uh, reality TV cool and shamelessness cool, that changed everything. And uh, once shame as a behavior modification tool, I'm sure uh, you all have experienced it to some degree in, in that respect, can be valid. It has negative connotations like my experience where that wasn't anything I had any control over. So it's not really fair to make me feel shame for it. But with other situations as a control device for societal needs, it has, it has a place. And that's where I do think modesty, if not modesty, but if an enforced morality can come into play and that's societal in origin for sure. So the answer is yes and no. I think those things are connected. But they don't necessarily require each other to survive or exist. Well... Yes, David, I think you're half right there because anonymity allows a lot of behaviors to happen. But in reality, we didn't, when you were off the net for a long time, uh, if you behaved or asked or did the things that you do under the cover of anonymity, you would still experience uh, a shaming. And from my observations, it seems to me that that is less the case these days. That yes, anonymity and then finding others that support your um, sort of societally objective bad way of thinking or operating has made that more prevalent. Yes. Donnie, you got to head out. Hey, thanks for hanging. That was fun. Good convo. We'll catch you next time, hopefully.
Generally speaking, you feel humanity is, as a whole is a little bit more shameless than it used to be. Yeah, that's, that's possible. I mean, there's, there's a lot of argument to be made in regard to, you know, secularization of society and um, social norms of the past. I mean, you know, there was a time when you should have felt when you were required by society to feel shame for dating someone from a different race. Arguably, this is still the case in some places. Um, but f the vast majority of us know that that's absurd. So there's things where the shame around something doesn't make sense and is not helpful to society. And those I'm happy to see uh, exit the door. So it's a case by case. I think I think in general, if we got rid of shame in relation to our personal lives, like just how we interact amongst ourselves, with our family, friends, lovers, etc., that shame has no place in that realm. But when it comes to social responsibility, like actual responsibility, that it does. And I, I personally would define it thusly. I really like how that pink of the ear kind of is, is sitting inside that, that uh, uh, the caustic of our bottle, that color combinations is handsome. think accent value pass speculars and we're done we're over by half an hour than our normal time but it's all right i wasn't really doing much else today <laughs> it's been a good convo so it's i feel good about it yeah when everybody's chatting it's it, time flies eh Transluminosity. Talking about fantasy and magic the gathering gathering have I ever played DD? Oh a man, I grew up on D D. I love, love tabletop role playing games. And finding a good group is like mm, it's magic. Let's get a little ambient occlusion in. I miss I miss table, tabletop quite a bit. It was a really big feature of my youth. <clears throat> Daryl, thank you so much for that follow. I recommended you get into D and D to practice story st storytelling skills. Absolutely. I think if you want to be a great concept artist, um, honestly, an artist in general or a writer or anything, there's nothing like role playing games. Role playing games are like pretend boot camp. 
And by that, I don't mean it's like pretending to be in boot camp. I mean, it's boot camp for pretending. To clarify. Yeah, no worries, Donkers. You can play D and D on your own. It's called writing. <laughs> yes, that is partially true. There's there's something about building the story out with other people that makes it really unique. I think. Even when I was writing, I always did did better and came up with better ideas when I had somebody else to bounce my ideas off of. But yes, I also recommend writing for an artist. Failed attempts and one shots, yeah. I've had some really, in my desperation to find like a good group, I've had some really weird interactions. <laughs> There's something about trying to find adults who role play that are not creeps. That's really hard. Um, God, I had I remember one that was really awful. Uh, there's a there's a slight side story to it, but uh, I I gamed for a short period and, and maybe a couple of months on a regular adventure with these guys that I, I had found through a there's a, there's a website I can't remember what it's called, but it was basically like a forum site where you could broadcast that you're running games and then pick up players or, or whatever. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I went on that because I was really hankering for a game. And I, I found this group that was in the Valley, not too far from where I lived. And it was the, the, the players were pretty cool guys. They were all like, you know, just app developers, just random weirdos and, and just generally pretty nice, chill, like old school nerds which I appreciate. New school nerds weird me out. Old school nerds that are like uncomfortable in their skin, like could, like socially anxious. They don't, you know, they, they, I can relate to them. I get them. New nerds that have no shame, no fear. I don't get these kids freak me out. <laughs> so anyway, there was, these were like just your classic nerds and they had this GM and the GM was this older guy who was like maybe 30 years older than everybody. He was like in his I want to say early 60s and he was a hoarder and lived alone and he was a, he was a kook definitely a kook but he would regularly use experience points to try to manipulate the group into doing specific things like if he wanted a ride to some place he would allocate experience points to people and it was the weirdest I was like, you know that this has no actual value. I actually had to like confront him first. And then I confronted the guys and they were like, well, you know, he's just like this, he's this old guy who just like, whatever. And I'm like, no man, this is messed up. You can't do that. That's, first of all, it kills the game. And second of all, it's just gross and manipulative. I thought it was very weird. I had another group where everybody fought constantly. <laughs> Uh, it was pretty funny. Like the, the GM on that one was like this, like super chill, like surfer guy. He just wanted to just hang out and have a good time. And everybody at the table wanted to have such a different experience that I don't know how he managed it for as long as he did. The group totally collapsed, but God, it was weird. <laughs> 
I remember I, I liked I liked most of the guys in the group quite a bit. There was one guy, I, we got along well enough, but he was this ultra hardcore right wing and Randian objectivist. And so he, even in game, he would constantly try and needle me for, uh, you know, my political leanings. In game, in character, he would still throw out these barbs all the time. It's like, oh my God, dude, come on. We got along all right, but not my dude. How do I recommend finding community for that kind of thing as a new player? Uh, you're not going to find it an in-person tabletop thing during a pandemic at all, man. I'm sorry. It's, if if they exist, and I actually know a couple of them that do still fucking meet uh, weekly, I'm fear for them. But at the same time, you know, they're a very tight group and they only ever see each other. So they're being as safe as they can be within those within those parameters. But your best way is to find something online. There's tons of just get on get on Google. There's lots of places you can dig up uh, ongoing games, campaigns, start a new one. They exist. You found some really weird people, haven't? Yeah. If you play any MMO, MMO or PUBG on role playing server, chances are the friends you find there also play tabletops. That's true. Uh, Facebook groups and Reddit are great places. I know that there's a couple of those services, like it's like an online tabletop service where they basically did all the math and they have dice and everything and they, you can make your own maps in them. I can't remember the names of them offhand. I'm t it's totally spacing on them, but th a lot of those will have forums connected to them for finding uh, groups. So there's lots of, lots of places to, f to look. Surfer guy, yeah. Roll20, that's it. Thank you. Roll20 was the one I was thinking of. I played a couple of games through Roll20, but those were with people I already knew. We just used their service. Also, understand that in all likelihood, any game that you join in this fashion is going to die. Every game that I've played or started since the pandemic has died. But if you want to learn the ropes and kind of have some fun, I, rec I definitely recommend getting into it. But your best bet is to find, there's a, another way, actually, another great way to find a group, and that's to go to hobby shops. Um, go to hobby shops, go and chat with people, make friends. Uh, I have a good friend that I used to work with at Sony, and he's a, he's a professional DM. Like he actually does it for money now in LA. And he started out of Arrow Hobbies on uh, Washington, I think it was. And they had, they had groups that would regularly meet and they would run through the latest kits and, and play games. And then he started making new games. And now he does like, he, he does actual paid gigs where he'll run a campaign, you know, for several hours with a bunch of kids or things like that. It's like really cool what he's done with it. So you can totally find uh, a good game that way, the old fashioned way. The key, in my opinion, to finding a group and then sort of like integrating yourself into it is in how you comport yourself. It's, you wanna absolutely be the kind of person that you would want to hang out with. So take your time, um, be friendly, never ever get pushy with a group trying to get in. And, you know, minimize, be, be a, this is how I've always worked it, be a, be a character, and, and I don't mean the character in the game, I mean you as a person, be a character that's an interesting addition to the composition of the group. Never be a point of drama. Never cause, uh, never cause issues if you can avoid them. Try, try your damnedest to just get along, and and you will go along, guaranteed. Get along with everybody. Yeah, roll twenty is great. 
Adelheid. You've been in an online campaign for three years. Damn, that's awesome. I'm a little jealous, Avid. Fuck. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. RT Mora. It's my friend RT. Um, he's He's got a business, basically, where he does online um, games and runs them. I don't know if you know him. He works, he, he works in um, the support services at Sony, so he's not in the, he's not in the art team. Great guy. Love that dude. And he's a great example, I think, of somebody that has really mastered being the kind of person that just compliments a group. Like he's really good at, at people. I really admire that about that guy. His, I think, you know, in, in my obs observations with him, his initial kick that seems to work really well is he's he's an extremely generous man um he's very very giving with his time very giving with you know his appreciation he's one of those people that just you you're gonna know that he values you being there and he's he makes sure to let people know and that that means a lot what do they say good good vibes only right Donkers, got to head out. Hey, thanks for hanging, man. Glad you could join. Take care. It's more work to organize an online game. It's true. Yeah, if especially if there's different time zones, it can get really difficult um, to manage the an online game. That's ultimately what killed one of my first ones. I was in a really fun game uh, that had a really incredible setting. It was uh, run by the original designer on Fortnite. He's an awesome guy that I met in Puerto Vallarta. Very cool dude. And we we were kind of like uh, only a couple of the core types, uh, core gamer types where we would we were outsiders. <laughs> we were we were the nerds around a bunch of normies. Uh, so we we talked, you know, miniatures and all sorts of things all the time. And we, we ended up starting a game and he ran this game. I think I've told you guys about it before really early in the Twitch when I was still playing it. But it was a it was basically Dungeons and Dragons, but set as a Western. And it was so cool. It was a great and great setting. I played a, uh, a decrepit old snake oil salesman named Emmett Ashbright. It was great. This old pervert <laughs> going around selling tonics for your ween. Once everybody's in the same room. That's true. I think being in the same room really does make it work the best. But barring that, you know, work with what you can. Join Avid's group. <laughs> Well, shit, I think this might be the longest session I've done. I've actually been long enough on to get hungry. <laughs> but I got to finish this guy. He's been We've been painting on him too long. But we've been having some really good topics to discuss, which I've been enjoying quite a bit. Thank you all for that. Let's do a unifying uh, glaze pass real quick. 
Oops, nope, that's not what I want to do. I want to make a new layer and set that to multiply. Don't play with kids nor parents with kids in the same game. Ah, yeah, that's a tough one. I also prefer not to play with couples um, because, yeah, that always gets weird too. Or, like, I've also had issues where uh, when you have men and women playing together where it's almost always guys, the guys will creep on the on the girls' characters as a way to try to get with the girls, and that's been really don't do that just accent values unifying my darks by creating little pops can see how tight my value key was when I add darks to it. Look at that. That's also part of why I need to do a glaze layer. It's just to knock it all back. Let's select our gob, oop, wrong gobby. You, 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 you. Oops. Oops, 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 I did it wrong. I did it wrong! Where's that glow at? Where's that glow living? Okay, not you, you, you. You, you, nope, you, ha ha, ha, I win, you, 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 yes, okay, we're going to mask this one off, masked, I'm going to pick a nice light color, I think something... Hmm, he's got good cools, good warms. Let's try something just neutral and see how that plays out. Slight neutral warm. Let's get a nice uh, glazy brush. I'm not going to use my noise one because there's already enough noise. And let's just try and unify some of these values down. Get a clear shadow side. Clean that one up. Can't have that there. You're playing with two groups where you're managing fine with the pandemic, but in-person sessions are better. Agreed. Usatek and Kirby Plesas. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for the follow. Glad you could be here. Please don't mind when I butcher your names. I imagine that's really common here on Twitch. I've seen some that are really bad. I was watching a, a, a YouTube um, every now and then just for background noise. I'll put on a couple of channels from YouTube where it's guys that are either analyzing or walking themselves through uh, gameplay for Warzone in particular or any, any, any shooter that I tend to play. Usually shooters because I'm interested in the tactics that they use. And... <laughs> listening to them try to some of these guys this one i was listening to the other day he was like uh this guy let's see his name is gorilla mo gorilla mo okay i'll just call him mo his name was guillermo <laughs> he did not he'd never seen the word guillermo before <laughs> i was like oh dude no no don't do that don't be that guy guillermo is not a hard word Gorilla Mo. Mm, just, mm. You've introduced your friend to one of the groups and immediately the two guys that were single went for her. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I have, I, as a single guy, have dated or gone after girls from a game that I was in, but not during game and not in character. Never do that. That is super uncouth. Um, certainly, like, after the game, you're hanging out and chatting. Be like, hey, you know, you're pretty cool. Would you be interested in meeting somewhere separate from the game? Don't do it in game. <laughs> I 
Although, <laughs> there, is a, there is a secondary story that ties to, to one of those. I did ask out a girl from a game once, and we met, and uh, it was quite quick. I did not expect it to go that fast, but it was pretty quick, uh, um, ending up hooking up and, and hanging out. Uh, but I always try to keep games separate from that, and she did not... <laughs> She very much started leaning into it really hard in game, and it was it made me very uncomfortable. It's like no, no, we can't do that. When it comes to honestly, just straight up when I'm GMing anyway, when it comes to sex, when it comes to flirtation, things like that, I tend to omit it or avoid it, or, or I will uh, use literary tools to, to bypass it. Because I just don't think that it's, it actually contributes. Almost always flirting is used as a form of like hardcore manipulation anyway. <laughs> like seduction skills. So it's okay to role play that. It's not such a big deal, but anything beyond that, anything serious is just not conducive to group play. There's other kinds of role play you can employ that for. You know what I'm saying? Time and a place, time and a place, gang. Gorilla Mo sounds better than Guillermo. Come on now, Adelheid, I'll have none of that. <laughs> Leon Peon and uh, Ray Rafe Vanderhoven, thank you so much for the follow, guys. Got to bounce dinner time. Hey, Calendar, thanks for hanging out. I am just about done here myself. I gotta eat. I have not eaten today. Got to get around to that. What time is it? It's what five now? No, it's almost four. Most of the time, it's just awkward to you. Uh, even watching it, oh yeah, even watching it is awkward and cringy. It's, it makes me feel very cringed out. I don't like it. Since this is a glaze, I'm just wiping out the highlights and the shadows for the glaze. Let's hit it with one more, I think. Let's do a tint layer. We're going to make another one. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to grab and mask. And I kind of want to just soften some of these shadows that I've got that are a little too strong. Just using, oops, using a big, fat, soft brush. Bloody hell, will you just behave? I think for this one, I will use a noise brush. Kova, don't start. happened during a MMO raiding. <laughs> nice. Biscuit, thank you so much for that follow. Glad you could join. People are getting irked at two players just flirting. Yeah. Certainly time and a place. Basically, my rule tends to be avoid flirting if the person that you're flirting with cannot get away. <laughs> like, don't even bother. So at game, no. When they're on the job, no. Do not, do not engage in that sort of shit. That's not cool.
Now they say, you know, when it comes to that sort of thing, certainly you want to you want to f- meet people that are doing things that you like to do also so that you ha- already have that thing shared in common and that's totally fine but my rule would still apply don't if they can't get away like if you enjoy deep sea fishing and you meet someone deep sea fishing and they can't get away from you don't do it there afterwards always leave people the societal crisco of being able to escape quietly and congenially <laughs> No one likes to be cornered. You got to head out, David. Hey, thanks for coming and hanging out, man. It's good combos. Appreciate it. Take it easy. Leon Peon, first time stumbling upon this stream. Ah, oh, thanks. Well, you can watch the other ones in the v- uh, the VODs, and then I back up all of my videos on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Izzy Medrano. So you can see previous paintings and discussions there or my random storytelling nonsense. <laughs> Whatever. Come on down. Give us a subscribe over there if you like it. You wish more men were like that? Yeah, it's a it's a pity. I think a lot of it is just, it's kind of like what we were talking about with the, with societal norms for work. It's, there's a lot of societal norms that are expressed in how, in the stories that we tell and in our expectations societally and how things should work. If, if we made, if we were ever able to make the dating process more egalitarian, where it was totally normal and common for women to ask men out just as much as men do women, I think it would make it a lot le- because then they would understand what it feels like. They would, there would be more sympathy for, from both sides in how difficult sort of traversing this really important and, and common, but also special interaction between people. It's, it's very difficult and very weird. If we just if we just made it more egalitarian, I think it would make everybody's lives a lot easier. Let's go back to painterly. I always like to cover if if I'm going to do uh, really heavy airbrushing, I like to break it up as fast as possible with some texture. I find, I find just softness on its own for a surface uncomfortable if that's not the point of the whole thing. If it's meant to look really, really soft and smooth, then fine. But if I can get away with not doing that, even if it is meant to be a soft and smooth thing, if I can hint at it with some texture and brush strokes, I'd rather go that way. Just me, just personal. Personal preference, you know. This piece kind of resembles Trump. <laughs> Thanks, Darth Nelly. I'd say a lot of my goblins kind of have a Trump look. I don't know why. I can't imagine. <laughs> I think that what I was just saying about the smoothing, that also comes into play with my smudge brush. Um, I purposefully will not smooth the entirety of a brush stroke, just part of it, because I want some, I want some of that texture always visible. Ow, I got an itchy.
at this stage, if you're here as a painter, this is what I'd call the noodling stage where we're just in there and we're just softening and adding detail upon detail. And this, that's common knowledge. Everybody can kind of thinks of that the same way, but not everybody knows what it is that you're focusing on. What are you looking for that warrants a noodle or spending some time with it? And the way I approach that is always making sure that I'm getting rid of unnecessary value jumps. So for example, these wrinkles are fine. I like them, but the value difference between the dark side and the light side is much too strong. I want to simplify it. It's a, it is a byproduct of the sketch phase. So what I'll go in is just try and a lot of the noodling phase that the last, you know, 10, not even 10, the last 2% of a painting is just going in and trying to smooth the work that you've done so that it doesn't feel so jarring compared to some of the other stuff. That's it. So it'll involve softening lines, scribbling in little bits of detail, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's feeling pretty solid. The mouth is basically it, I think. I would like to get the mouth to the same level of finish looking as the, as the eyes. I think we need to make dating a lot simpler. That's almost all your previous boyfriends out first. But the keyword is asked. Most of the guys just start flirting and make the whole thing weird. Yeah, well, part of that is that we can't, if, if we're asking outright, that's also rude. Like we're, we're taught anyway that we're supposed to go through this whole icebreaker period. Um, but, and this, and in my experience, this has actually been the case in, in a few, in, in a few situations where if you don't hint at interest beyond just, I like you, you're an interesting person. We're having fun talking. If you don't hint at that at some point early on, then it's your the the opportunity for that is lost and when i say that i mean so a perfect example would be i went on a date when i was in puerto vallarta and i was super chill about it like i did not press anything we had really we hung out for an entire day we went we went for coffee and we ended up spending the entire day together we, you know we went swimming and did all sorts of really fun activities. I thought it was going fucking awesome. I was like, dude, this girl's cool. We're having a great time. Um, very chill, hung out all night. And by the end of the night, she basically gave me a report card saying that like, I was too nice and uh, she didn't know, she didn't know what I wanted. So she didn't, she didn't put me in that category. I was like, damn, okay, well, it is what it is. Lesson learned. So on dates now, I try to, I always want to keep it relaxed and, and zero pressure, but I do emphasize, and sometimes I'll even just say it outright that, uh, that I'm interested, but it, but to get to that point is really tough. So and good on you for just asking the guys out. That's, that's amazing. And so rare. First time, first time it ever happened to me was in New Zealand, where I guess it's really not uncommon at all for women to ask out the guys. The women there were very forward, which was so cool. Also, in New Zealand, I have an accent, which is amazing. <laughs> Girls thought I was cute because of my accent. <laughs> what a good feeling. OK, 
Okay. Let's get in on these teeth and let's call it done. I can tell you, dating-wise, either way, the pandemic has completely fucked that up. Like, it is so hard to do anything now. I mean, you can't meet. You can't... I, I've tried everything in that respect. You when, And I'm sure many people that, that are trying to date during the pandemic have had similar experiences. Like, you match with somebody on a dating site, and then you talk and talk and talk and talk, and you just talk about every damn little thing with no end in sight, no, you know... Maybe you'll you'll uh, work up enough confidence in each other to meet, but even then, so then once you meet, because you've gone out of, out of your way to meet, then you're stuck in a in a feedback loop there, where, you know, you've been around each other, you're both know that you're okay, so you can trust each other, but now you're kind of forced into something that maybe a little bit more permanent than you would have originally intended, or that has more. Uh, consequence than you originally intended like it's it's tough it's a very weird time to be single you got the dead black tooth <laughs> dating was tough before the pandemic yeah and now it's just it's nigh on impossible also it's like the conversations it's like groundhog's day Every match, every match. How's your pandemic going? Oh, what are you doing? Did you learn to break? Did you learn to bake sourdough? Cool. Yeah, it's like this. It's always the same, and I guess it's always kind of been like that. Oh, what do you do? What's this? What's that? So, I've taken on a uh, a very strong uh, penchant, if you will, for just getting down to like the tough topics. Like real fast, like, hi, how's it going? What's your opinion on abortion? <laughs> like, or <laughs> uh, how do you feel about protesting? Like, just get into the get into the dirtiest, craziest topics as fast as possible, as as fast as like societal norms will allow. I'll be like, I just tell them straight up, like, hey, you know, we've, I'm sure you've talked endlessly about your your pandemic experiences and how you're tired of wearing pajamas. Let's talk about some real shit. Do you think the moon landing was faked? Just boom. I got a phantom. Oh, I did. You're right. Thank you for that. Don't know when it happened. Let's undo, 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 undo. Oh, it happened a while ago. Uh-oh. And I just undid everything because I accidentally moved stuff. Well, life is great. Let's just keep painting. That does happen sometimes. We just lost several minutes of work. Not the end of the world. Thanks, crickets. I appreciate that. Dating sites never work for you. Yeah, I've had a couple of those where once we met in person, it just wasn't it, it wasn't any. There wasn't the chemistry. I prefer meeting in person, but even then, that's always been tough. Like I'm not really like a bar fly type where I can pick people up at the bar. I've done it. I don't really like it. I'm like a more of like a house party person, you know, meet a cool person at a house party, chat, that sort of thing. But guess what? Weed them out. Yeah, I agree. 
Yeah, the weird conversations Adelheid are have always been my most favorite in person as well. But with the with the dating apps, I get to just cut to the chase. Like, hey, you know, I'm tired of the same old topics all the time. Let's talk about some crazy shit. And I'll always preface with the fact that I'm a total open book. She can ask me anything she wants, literally anything. And I'll talk, talk about it. And usually that tends to kind of make it fun and a little bit more playful. So it's not so serious or weird to ask really heavy questions. I hope it works. I mean, obviously, I'm not a mind reader. I don't know. Some seem to respond to it. All I know is I'm just tired of small talk. went about 40-ish dates and talked to hundreds of people, but eventually it really paid off. And you'll be with your current girlfriend until you die. That's awesome. Congrats, Avid. That's great. Santelio and Axel Zorro Casa. Thank you so much for the follow. Glad y'all could join. You've got the boyfriend now, but you met him at a concert. Nice. <laughs> Bloody hell, I keep getting these little outsets. Let's see if there's any more. Mm, doesn't look like it, okay. Let's add our speculars and I think we can call it done. You know, I don't want it to be super shiny, so let's pick a different brush than that. Kova, enough. Show me someone that doesn't like the Amelie soundtrack and I'll show you a person without a heart. I swear. <laughs> I'm trying to purposefully keep this a little bit matte and less shiny. I don't want it to feel like it's wearing lipstick. I want it to feel like the, it's, it just has black lips. Inside the mouth does need speculars. Hmm. <laughs> 
May May, thank you so much for that follow. Glad you like it. Sanabil, how's it going? Welcome back. Should act like you own the place so you recommend the ripest apples? <laughs> H-on, yes, it has. Putting a cloud of building behind the wand, a cloud of build, what is a cloud of building? We've, uh, oh, cloud or building, I see. Yeah. I think the value, the value is okay at card size. It's, but what, what is gonna make it work the most at card size is the color. So it's, it's visible enough for me, I think, at card size. I don't need to add more detail yet. What I do want to add is some more separation. So that's what this is. We're gonna do a, uh, another atmosphere layer. We're gonna do it very localized. Did I answer your question, Mei I'm sorry. Uh, I think I've been working on it for three or four sessions. This is, I think this is our fourth session. I started it last week. But there was a lot of uh, hypothesizing and ranting in the middle of that. So <laughs> there was a lot of me not painting too. <laughs>
Five months? What? Thanks, Avid. Did you intend to do that? <laughs> I don't know if you did or not. I'm sorry if you didn't. Let's also I think if we go up here. Oh yeah. Yeah, that'll do. Wait, what? No, I thought you were a screen layer. Oh, I see. I see what you did, you bastard. That's why I like the noise brush. It just gives you that nice particulate effect with the atmosphere. A little bit of noise in your airbrush can go a long way to, to kind of, it knocks back the overly painterly strokes that I had just a touch, just enough to give it that air of, of a little bit more solid realism. You didn't think I'd been streaming for five months? Yeah, well, I've been streaming since May, I want to say, June, somewhere in there. Maybe it was June I started. That's when I first started. And then I was off for a month because the computer was busted. Um, but yeah. Oh, but that that month really hurt. I mean, we dropped in viewership significantly. So it happens. It happens. I just didn't realize it would happen so harsh. Because I've been painting. I'd say I've been doing the show as long now. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's only been two months since the since it blue screened on us in the middle of the Twitch. That was fun. Sweet. I think, uh, yeah. I think we're done. I'm I'm cool with this. There's there's little things that I would noodle, but for a Twitch specimen, this is very rendered. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it as it is. We're going to call it done and we'll start a new painting with our next session on Monday. So hopefully all will join us then. Uh, it's, uh, my schedule is Mondays and Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard and Saturdays around noon, sometimes before, sometimes after. You have a first badge. You think you subbed on the first stream. Oh my God, really? Is that what that means? That's amazing. So yeah, if you're interested in seeing more of these videos, uh, check out the VOD down below. There's also the YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Izzy Medrano. And then you've seen over here, there, here, this way, you've seen my, uh, my credentials for, not credentials, my um, usernames for uh, social media popping up. So give us a follow there, whatever, so you can see these images finished in JPEG format. Awesome. Well, thank you all for hanging out. It's been a really good, super long session. Y'all take it easy. And until next time, paint smart, paint sexy. I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because like they did, you want to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not. You're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks. And you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair, but what if you want to paint a dragon, or figure out how to render a sea of fire, or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication, and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. Like grammar is for language, light, color, and form literally follow a formula. 
painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using this simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there. Until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds. Because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see and how you understand what you're seeing. I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly. Anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you 